Welcome to the Linux Plumber Conference 2021. This is the scheduler micro conference. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to see so many names that I'm used to seeing face in, in conferences, but also new faces in the community, which is always good, right? So before I start, we would like to say thanks for the sponsors. Uh, we have Facebook as diamond sponsored of the Linux Plumbers. We have IBM as Platinum, ARM and Microsoft as Gold sponsors, AWS, uh, Netflix and Red Hat as Silver sponsors, and Collabora as Speaker Gift sponsored. We always like Speaker Gift, and VMware as T-shirt sponsors. Uh, also Linux Foundation with conference services. And so before I start, uh, we know that discussions uh, on Linux community sometimes get warm, but let's keep it uh, technical, let's keep it friendly, and uh, let's behave, right? Let's make this a nice conference where everybody can speak and give their own opinion without any kind of fear or anything that blocking want to say uh their their thoughts on the technical topics that's what makes our community what it is makes linux a successful project and yeah if you have anything you would like to complain please uh ping us and uh let's find a a, a good way from good way out from any discussions but um uh, any any word Davo? any word uh Vincent, Yuri? Uh, I, I think we just want to clarify how to answer, how to ask questions, how to um, point out you have a question to ask. Okay, sorry. You mean you would like to clarify with me to so, so, you know, because this is a virtual uh, conference and uh, chat doesn't seem to be working very well for most of us. Uh, the best way, the protocol we followed last year, and I think we should follow this year, is if someone has a question, um, just turn on your camera. Uh, so one of us will know that you have a question and we can bring you in as quickly as we can. Uh, you know, depending on the speaker, feel free to interrupt if you think it makes sense. Uh, and all the, all the good rules we have followed at LPC in the past. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, just this housekeeping note here, please keep your microphone and camera muted when you're not actively participating. But as soon as you want to speak, you have any topic, just turn your camera on. That's the sign that you, you would like to speak or just turn the audio on and say, hey. Any thoughts, any questions? Should we start? Yeah, I think it's time to start. Here we go. All right. So, ah, last last point. Uh, I would like to ask you all to help on taking notes of the conference. Uh, the the organization will ask us for the notes, so people that didn't uh, participate could read it through the news. So. Any everybody that's participating on discussion, which is or trying to to learn, you know, if you have time, please help us take notes. And that's it. Now I give the word to Francesco. Just let me make him the presenter. Thank you. It's all yours. Okay. Thank you. So, hello everyone. I'm going to talk to you about <laughs> migrations and propose you a tool that could help you investigate them. Uh, I worked with uh, uh, Dr. Dario Fagioli and Professor Enrico Bini, who I'm pretty sure you know pretty well. Uh, my name is Francesco Giraulo. I'm a, a master student in computer science at the University of Turin. And I did my bachelor thesis on uh, migrations flag and I'm still working on migrations. Okay. Uh, our problem was to try to find out uh, the uh, root cause of migration inside a, a system, uh, especially because during the 
previous uh, research on the flags, we were not able to have uh, really accurate results because we didn't know the um, migration cause of the bench of migration we found. And we needed uh, something more accurate than just some quantitative uh, results. So we uh, tried to find a way to uh, get the, the causes uh, in a direct way. Uh, by now, the only way is just to manually dive through the records of a trace command report, for example, and try to investigate the reason. Uh, but it's not really scalable for a large bunch of uh, migrations. So we want to uh, try to find a way to automatize it. Uh, actually, I'm trying to um, code something, a tool that could help it on it. And it, in uh, its first level, is trying to add some depth to the record representation. In, uh, its first level is trying. Okay. And uh, um, the. Basically, modeling the data offered by the report, the record string, um, offering both a common API for the, for example, core or timestamp, and something more specific to the record type. For example, the source or destination core in a migration, or the process name uh, names in a switch. Uh, another interesting point is to merge the continuous information spread across the reports. For example, uh, an easy point is to uh, collect the record and its stack trace that are actually in separate uh, records, or try to uh, collect the data from uh, function graphs, start uh, entry and exit point of a function, and try to define a more fine grained uh, filtering in order to filter the specific, uh, for example, migrations record better than the switch records. By now, um, the tool is offering an uh, interactive research support, uh, helping the user to get the next record that is filters compliant and keeping some uh, information from the skipped records. Well, they are not actually skipped, they are collected in a history that could group them by core or by process name. And the semantic information we can collect is basically everything because, uh, um, for example, just for example, we could collect the last uh, uh, process switch in if we have the switch events uh, recorded or uh, the uh, quantity of time uh, the CPU was uh, idle in the time window. And uh, uh, yes, it, the tool is, off, is able to offer also some statistics from the whole record for the whole report or for some time windowed or process related uh, information. Of course, we want to do uh, some step more and try to uh, find the patterns or the logic to uh, label the root case of immigration in an automatic way. Okay, uh, the way the tool is working is basically uh, object oriented. So we can, compose, we can build some composite objects over the records uh, splitting the common parts and the specific record type, uh, handling the trace like a uh, stream in a functional like framework. And uh, uh, in a similar way, we can um, make the stream flow through some uh, stackable and customizable blocks that are the one of collecting the semantic information, for example, or collecting the traces or filtering the records themselves. Okay, by now uh, the tool is basically a library with a simple uh, uh, terminal interface. And uh, uh, for example, we can see uh, some output of, from the use case I will show you in a while. And uh, um, for example, we can just try to filter the skid migration task that re is related to PID uh, for a specific PID and obtain the running uh, task in the moment of the migration and the idle time. Our use case uh, was to try to analyze the migrations of a uh, while one process, so uh, strictly CPU bounded, in an unloaded system. So uh, we were assuming that the process will not migrate will not migrate so much because um, it will never it will never leave uh, willingly the running state, and no other processes need uh, more CPU that is available because basically all the cores are idle. 
uh, so we were supposing little to no migration should occur. Unexpectedly, the number of migrations is not negligible, and uh, uh, some of the migration could uh, seems counterintuitive. In fact, uh, well, we have here just some data from the use case um, tested on the last kernel version, and we can see how even if the uh, migration of a uh, CPU bounded in a, a lot of systems to just add overhead is not always the case. In fact, uh, uh, the um, mean time, running time of processes that are pinned to a core, so they are not allowed to migrate, is usually higher than uh, the free to migrate tasks. And we are not sure about the reason. But using the tool, and you can see the bottom part of the slide, we add, uh, uh, for example, for this migration, the one uh, uh, in the top, um, th there is no actually a uh, task who needs the core. In fact, the uh, while one process is migrating from CPU 4 to CPU 10, and uh, the first process that is entering the CPU 4 running is just uh, two seconds after the switch. So it cannot be, it cannot be the reason. So uh, it should be related to the balancing, but balance to idle core could be at least unexpected. So, uh, well, this is uh, an insight about the, the tool. And of course, we, are, we wanted to study more the migration of Y1, but uh, we need more time. So uh, I think I say that I need about the tool and the use case. I would love to hear your feedback about how the, if the tool could be useful and uh, if it would be worth it to try to make the labeling automatic. So thank you. I have a question for you. So, um, did you uh, have you been able to find the root cause, or did you say that you haven't found the root cause of this uh, while one? Uh... Okay, I didn't find the root cause. Uh, we are thinking that the point is a uh, balancing between the cores, because uh, um, since we have no task to actually need the cores, we think it's something between uh, the balancing. We have no, no other uh, causes. Okay, and and just for me, um, how do you plan? I have, I'm not sure I have, uh, catch. How do you plan to label the migration root cause? I mean, uh, when you have identified that the task migrate, so you want to label that about why the migration of occurs, but which kind of uh, label do you want to put that? Uh, okay, uh, the idea was to try to find out, for example, if a uh, uh, migration is caused from the balancing or if it's called from, uh, caused by uh, an exec, so, uh, or other causes, because since we are, at least I'm coming from a, a flag related research, I want to understand if the migration are uh, occurring for one of the causes uh, related to the flags or for, a, I would say, normal condition. So it's just to understand better. Uh, so I, I this, this kind of reminds me of our uh, talk last year on you know whether the Oracle database should be using real time or not. And one of the things we did notice was an extreme number of migrations. I I wonder if this could help with that. But uh, by now is uh, uh, it it could not because it is not uh, ready for our. Uh, real time execution but uh, uh, i was talking with some we were thinking to just uh, uh, move it in a more um, i would say like uh, implementation in order to be used in a real time uh, environment but by now by, by real time you mean real time or twitter like real time 
Sorry? Real, by real time, you mean actual real time or Twitter like real time? You know what Twitter means when they say real time? No, I mean, I think, I mean, not real, real, real time. Okay, yeah. so no, okay. Uh, we're, we're running the Oracle processes as can other. We're not running right. them as real time. When we are running them as can other, uh, even okay. on systems that should not be heavily loaded, they are migrating a lot. Okay, so yes, that could be, uh, I mean, uh, if we continue the developing uh, and, and we actually find a way to automatic label them, I mean, if we need to find the patterns or at least the logic beyond the migrations in uh, in some specific case in order to make it automatic. And after this, yes, it could be sure, I'm sure it could be useful. Okay. So did you look into active migration? I think active migration is what is causing just like idle processes to at random times just steal other idle processes. I'm not uh, to uh, steal other processes that are just running by themselves. Yes, uh, uh, this is one of the that okay. In the first stage of, of research, we found out that there are some patterns uh, of a core try to uh, stealing from another uh, core just because it's idling. But in some cases, uh, there is something like, okay, uh, the core is running uh, or while one is just pushing away the task because, I don't know, some kernel-related task or driver-related something really quick is using the CPU. So we wanted to investigate if that is really a uh, um, useful migration. Uh, so not, not just the active migration, but even the, um, the migration that are not I would say not intuitive because if um, a while one process should run on a core forever, basically, and uh, uh, if it, just a driver is taking few time slices, it's not a big deal and maybe should not be migrated. I don't know if I answered your question. Okay, uh, so I, mean, I was just thinking of the case I often see that. Um, a idle core will just every now and then will just steal a thread from a core that is running only one process. Uh, I didn't hear you pretty well. Sorry, can you repeat? I often see that an idle core will steal a thread from another core that is running only one process. Yes, it's happening. Yeah, that's your situation also. So yeah. I think that's the active balancing um where a core feels frustrated that it's not able to steal anything recently and so it just steals something um okay so you can look and see if that's your situation um i was also wondering like a uh, kind of annoying thing is that there are four uh, to my recollection there's aren't there several different occurrences of um the migrate task event in the kernel uh sorry are they um there's as you point out there's different reasons for having a migrate task yes. event and i wonder if you could suggest that we have maybe some different trace points to indicate what the different situations are or different arguments of the trace point or enhance the trace point in some way to indicate something about the context well but by now i'm not sure if uh, we can, we need some more trust point because uh, mm -hmm. I have, I had not, okay, I was not able to find out the root cases. So maybe with some trace point, it could be uh, more easy, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, by now I'm not sure because I uh, didn't dive so much inside the code. I worked more on the uh, behavior of the system. So in a, I need to check more the code. And if it's the case, to try to figure out a way in which put or in which put the trace points. But by now, I didn't consider that thing. Okay, it's just that load balancing is quite a different thing than when a process just wakes up and wants to go to another. It's just getting put on a different course, so it could be more intuitive to have more different trace points. Yeah, I'm, I mean, yeah, that could be surely a way. Uh, okay. I will, uh, I will uh, keep note. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
uh, this is Shreetar here. Uh, I would want to know if, uh, uh, can we, can't we use the callbacks, right? I mean, the, the tracing callbacks. Uh, if we have uh, enabled the callbacks, then uh, they could get, tell us uh, why we are calling the migrate, right? For example, uh, in the, like what Julia said, in the active balance, we would have seen the callback suggest the active balance. And if it was from a wake up path, we will get to know the signature that, you know, uh, this is from a wake up path. So can't we use the um, uh, call, call, uh, call graph stuff to uh, do this? Uh, the audio was not so clear. I'm sorry. Can you repeat? Okay. Uh, what I was saying is, uh, if we have enabled uh, the call graph stuff, right? I mean, when we are tracing, if we have enabled the call graph, uh, the perf would give us the uh, stack trace for each of the trace, right? So for each of the stack trace of uh, step migrate task, if you look at the uh, call graph, we would be able to uh, associate the reason why the migrate was done. Right. We should be able to. Uh, maybe if I understood correctly, I think uh, you and Srikar are suggesting to enable the stack, basically stack trace call graph for every uh, trace point. So then if you have a migration uh, oh, trace okay, point, okay, okay, okay. Yes. then you also have an associated stack. And from there, maybe you can understand. Uh, but I guess it's going to be a tricky process. I'm not sure. That, that, that is an option, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah okay. Uh, we tried this as first uh, try. Okay. The point is that even with only with the stack trace or even with the function graph, there are uh, common points between all the um, the migration causes, and the uh, differences are based on, I mean, uh, arguments uh, of the functions. So we are not sure just from the stack trace to understand which is the real region and uh, uh, sometimes the reason is not uh, inside the stack trace itself so uh, that's the point of the tool try to merge all the data from maybe several stack traces or the state of other functions or events and try to uh, got, get some big picture of the migration itself Yeah, I guess, I mean, personally, it's uh, been a while, actually, that I worked on uh, strictly on understanding the load balancing on CFS behavior. But for what I understood, also from what I recall from uh, mostly working with Dietmar was that we had basically uh, additional print case uh, that were basically printing kind of the reason why uh, migration uh, happened uh, during a particular workload. So I probably think the, the idea of adding information to the trace points. I'm not saying that we need to modify the current the current one, but we can probably attach a different one or attach more information to what we have. And it might help, I guess, in some cases. Okay, yeah. Thank you. So uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I think what you might find is that the migrations are correct, and then then you're gonna then the real question will be um, how did you get into the, that correct situation in the first place? And some things that I've seen are that there are um, tasks bound to certain CPUs or hardware interrupts, and so you've got your while one loop trying to run, but this other thing has taken over the CPU, and so it's perfectly natural for something to get, um, you know, a, a K soft IR QD is running and you've now, you're now queued up behind him, he's gonna get pulled onto another CPU, which is a perfectly natural thing to happen. So the real question is, well, did you really have to run that K soft IR queue in the first place, right? So it's, yeah. it's working properly, the, the, but, but you're not necessarily going down the path that you thought you should go down, right? You would think, hey, I should have the CPU all the time. So I haven't found any malfunctions. And I think you may perfectly illustrate what I'm saying when you're done, that it's working properly, but it's not working exactly the way you expected because unexpected causes are behind the migrations, right? I don't think that we're gonna, you're, I, I doubt very highly you're gonna find erroneous migrations. You're gonna find correct unexpected situations that caused correct migrations. Does that make any sense? So yeah. the real problem is, hey, 
Migration sounds like a great idea if you're going to be stuck in the back of a queue for a long time. The problem is you don't know if it's going to be a really short or really long. We have no, we don't know. In the meantime, you've got an idle CPU saying, hey, give me work, give me work. So he grabs the work and that's the right thing to do, but he didn't know that you were going to be done so fast. So then the question is, oh, is there a way that we can indicate we should be done so fast and we shouldn't do that? And maybe that would be an enhancement. Yes. Okay. I got your point. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that there are not erroneous uh, migrations, but uh, my idea was actually to uh, find out uh, why I was not expected these migrations. Of course, uh, it could be the point of uh, um, uh, of yeah, uh, a quick job is uh, just keeping uh, the CPU for a small, for a, a short time, so it's not the case to migrate. Mm, and that could be, of course, difficult to indicate. Mm, the strain, the the things that make me more uh, that makes less sense to me, but uh, like uh, in an unexpected point of view, is just um, the migration. The migrations are often a sort of uh, ping pong between uh, uh, two hyperthreads of the same physical core. And it's not something like, uh, um, I would say, uh, one shot. So, from yeah, two. I've seen that too. That's common, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because they're sharing the same L2. That's actually terrific, right? So, you've got your, say, you're on CPU zero and one and they're hyperthreads, you've got your bound. Uh, thread to CPU zero, you are running on CPU zero, that bound thread kicks you off, you you run on CPU one, that's actually the optimal result. That migration to CPU one is actually perfect. There's not a better place for you to have gone, right? And then, right. But, but, but then the awkward thing is, well, in some cases, depending on, you know, sort of which flavor of the scheduler we're running, you might, when he stops running on zero, my back, migrate back to zero, and that's completely wasted migration. That's just extra cycles, but at least you're still sharing the same L2, so it's not so bad. Uh, yes, of course, but uh, I mean, it's the number. It's like in five minutes trace, there could be even 25 or to 30 migrations. So, of course, it's, it's good that they are close enough, but maybe some of them could be avoided. That's the whole point. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm more okay with the migrate out than I am with the migrate back. The migrate back was wasted work, unless something really wants to run on CPU one in that case. Probably at the end of the day, what you want to do is total up the cycles that were due to the migration. I mean, you can't really count for loss of cache hotness, but you can total up cycles and you can actually, you know, say, great, how much tax am I paying for those migrations? How important is this problem? Because on a graph of where stuff runs, this looks like, oh, this is a huge sin to migrate. But, you know, a migrate in 20 seconds, I'm not too worried about a migrate in 20 seconds. You know, that's a really small percentage of cycles. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So a question, Francesco, more, more from the, let's say, from the academic side. Okay. Did you try to... To identify, identify and classify the reasons for a migration in a more high level um, way to try to try to, to put things on buckets, right? Okay, this kind of migration exists, it's good. This kind of migration exists, it's bad. Uh, it, it's good to migrate because of power savings. It's bad to migrate because of power savings. You know, because finding, okay, you're finding migration, right? And you try to define the root cause of them. Yes. But did, did you find uh, the possible root cause? Did you try to classify them and try to classify them with other, uh, other reasons, like if this is good, this is bad? Yeah, the, the idea was uh, starting from the um, root cause, try to figure out if the migration is good or at least how good it is. So yeah, this is the next step. But since, uh, uh, I mean, for me, the situations are often completely unexpected immigration. So I wanted to start from something more low level, understand the environment, let's say, and after this, try to put some things in the buckets, good, bad, not so bad. 
Yeah, I think, I think that, that that would clarify. We will give you better direction to the research, right? Because then you would be able to use the tooling that you have to do this kind of tracing, and uh, to 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 find some some more, let's say, some useful information from the trace you are getting, right? Because the root cause for immigration might be good to someone, it might be bad to to other kids. That there, yeah. there's a reason for the things that are occurring. Yeah. So. There's bugs. You may find some bugs, and that's terrific. It's not super likely that you'll find some bugs. The real question is, okay, what if the algorithm is correct, but you're migrating so much that you're spending a lot of cycles migrating, right? Or um, it doesn't seem like you're spending a lot of cycles migrating, but the things that you've migrated have lost their cache footprint because they used to be running over there. So you sort of have to quantify how important it was, A, the number of cycles that you used migrating that maybe you could have avoided, and B, what was the actual performance impact of migrating? So you're going to need something more clever than a while one to notice that 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 impact, right? Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. And measure that, and that's really the cost that you could optimize and fix is that performance impact. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, oh, another workload that we were um, playing with uh, uh, TBCC, we, we, we noticed that um, uh, even though the, 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 the CPU itself is like really busy, and, but sometimes like, uh, the, the workloads they like, sleep for, for a short while like, doing, doing something and then, and then wake back up again. So ideally, uh, you probably don't want us to migrate, uh, do, do the migration say, because say, that, that, that CPU is going to, to wake up and service again. But, but in reality, we noticed that um, the task actually get pulled around quite a bit. Um, so, so one thing we play around with is that we noticed that the, um, the, the idle, idle load balancing um does not uh has a very like almost uh, immediately say try to pull tasks say, if a if a cpu becomes idle uh it, it start pulling task right right away yeah it does not realize that oh like just just a microsecond later that i, I will be uh, busy again um so so it starts start pulling tasks so we 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 find a, a lot of uh, migrations say, due to that reason. So yeah, so we play around a little bit with um, like checking the um, uh, the the business of the CPU. If it's like ninety five percent, then we give it a longer say, idle like low balancing interval. So it does not try to pull task right away, but um, wait a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and and we, and we find that that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and so along the lines of what Tim said is he's pulling onto what's an instantaneously idle CPU, but then something wakes up that used to run there and now his CPU is busy and he has to move somewhere else because the inn is full, right? So if you run, say, NetPerf, you'll see this all the time. If you load balance instantaneously, a packet will come in and say, hey, wait, I was running here. Oops, prev CPU is now busy. I have to now run somewhere else which sucks, right? It's really bad, and on that workload, you'll really notice it. Yeah. Thanks, Francesco. It was a nice presentation. It was a nice discussion. Thank you. You are now on. Okay, let me, let me turn on my webcam. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Cool, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Oh, okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Cool. So my name is Libo. I'm from Oracle Primary Working um, Scheduler. Um, I'm, uh, I'm relatively new on this field, so uh, do correct me if I make any uh, mistake. So I plan to um, quickly um, explain the problem uh, as detailed as occur, and leave most of the time for for open discussion. Okay, so. Um, Oh, we do have a few people here who are familiar with the problem, so do jump in if uh, if uh, I miss out some uh, important details. Okay, 
So let me get to the problem. So basically, oh, before we describe the kind of the symptom, let me show you how to reproduce this. It's, so basically, you want to have an uh, um, uh, uh, interrupt heavy workload. So that could be like any kind of web server application. Uh, we use, uh, we found out this problem uh, using the uh, YSSB. Also, you can reproduce using IPO. The goal is to create many interrupts, uh, particular network interrupt, uh, as many as you want. So um, the second uh, condition is uh, you, uh, you want to bind the uh, network uh, IRQ to a specific socket, a new node. So, uh, so the reason for that is, uh, so this is actually a very common practice that the network performance is very sensitive to um, uh, to having IQ uh, rather to the diff uh, wrong socket. What that means is uh, oftentimes the PCI bus is direct connect to one socket, the PCI bus and PCI bus bridge. So you actually you will get a very bad performance if you have uh, if you route this uh, network interrupt to different socket. Um, so I found this uh, like a two times slower performance. Um, uh, but we do not see such a huge drop in performance, I think. Um, but also, and the, the fresh performance, by the way, the fresh performance is not very sensitive to that. So uh, that's kind of interesting. So basically what we saw is tests are getting pulled to the socket that the IQ bound to, okay? And leaving like the other socket nearly idle. You can also do that on an AMD uh, current chip, like basically bind the, the uh, network IQ to just one new node. So, and the, the rest of the new node will be like almost idle, right? So within that socket, the load is actually fairly balanced. So um, uh, I would, right, okay. So um, if you kind of spread out the tasks using like all kind of like using uh, binding, like task set. Um, uh, maybe tweak the kernel to spread out the task with uh, across sockets. We actually see a uh, performance getting better. Uh, the the YCFB uh, throughput getting better, particularly especially on the light low. Uh, on heavy low, on heavy low, it's a little bit um, we are uh, we're still trying to investigate that. So um, yeah, this is this is the MP stat from the uh, on the light low. So. Uh, CPU zero to 23 is the first hour throw from the first node. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, 48 to uh, 71 is the second hour throw. So this is the Intel chips. Um, you see the, the test mostly um, just one node, one, one socket, the first socket. Okay, the red socket mostly. This is, a, this is from a light load system. From the heavy load system, well, it's the, the other socket is not completely idle, but you see the the idle times like the idle percentage like 60 around 65 to 70, and um, the first socket is like pretty busy. And it, also you can see the 40, uh, 50 CPU 50 to 50 uh, CPU 22. Um, those have the C, uh, CPU that the network IRQ um, are bind to. So that's why you guess uh, you see this very high software IRQ uh, usage. Okay. Um, the what is the cost actually? Um, so, so it's actually the CFS wake ups, um, like active, active report all the wiki tasking, right? So, um, so because there's a very frequent wake ups um, from the network uh, interrupt, because of the networking interrupt, and also the uh, network IQ binding, because we have this. Uh, uh, our system, we have a static IQ binding, but uh, you can also do with kind of dynamic um, kind of range bind, um, but bind um, to a one uh, one socket, so that the, the interrupt, the network interrupt will like mostly uh, happen on those CPU, CPU on one, one node or one socket. Um, so the wake up will pull the task in. We also notice that it actually actively working against, you know, the periodic and the other load balancing. How that happens is because you have such a frequent interrupt and uh, you have this uh, complete school for uh, loads. So one socket can have more load and then the load balancing actually notice that, the periodic load balancing notice that, trying to pull the task, move the, some of the tasks to the, the idle socket. But the moment you move that um, loads, the, because the wake up is so frequent, so the wake up will quickly pull that uh, task 
uh, move the test back to the you know the the first socket. So this socket had the uh, network hierarchy value. So um, that's kind of like ping pong. It's 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 not um, it's kind of bad. It, it's it's really bad for the performance. Um, uh, so we look at the code, um, trying to understand why the weak cap is like uh, pulling out the tasking. So basically, uh, the weak cap will, uh, let's say if the weak cap will call the select task uh, uh, run queue fair, uh, which has uh, like two pass process, like determine whether to do weak or fine or not. So this is a weak or fine actually doing. So if the, uh, the weak cap uh, decided to do weak or fine, then it will put the task in, right? So that's how basically what happened. So the two processes, the first is they have the weak Y, um, the first uh, pass, basically a heuris to, to, to determine if you want to spread the, um, you want to do, basically you want to do weak uh, fine or not, right? So if the, the weak Y says, oh, no, yes, I want to do weak Y, then you will, um, uh, you will go to the second pass to determine if we still want to do the uh, uh, weak or fine or not. So, if you look at the heuristic, it kind of makes sense if the kind of weaker and wiki are somewhat related. So, for example, the weaker wiki, um, the weaker holding uh, a lock, right? And the one after you release the lock, you want to wake up the wiki who, uh, you know, trying to grab the lock. So that kind of makes sense. But when, it, but but with the interrupt, um, it's kind of um, it's pretty different because um, the interrupt happens. Um, so, but, but the weaker is actually not the, uh, the weaker task is actually not the one actually weak the wikis, uh, if that makes sense. Because the, the weaker task is actually the one who is running for a completely different reason. And uh, the interrupt came in, right, on this CPU that weaker is on. And they decided to, oh, let's, uh, we have the network packet in, then let's pull, uh, let's weak some uh, uh, wiki uh, up. Okay, so the whole the weak white thing, the wiki uh, wiki flip number, just the compare between uh, weak and wiki, just you know doesn't uh, make too much sense because they're not related at all. So what we found out is actually the weak white is all, almost always return zero. So basically means like do weak fine because we know there's like weak wiki yeah, actually have a very similar wiki flip, even though this uh, um, very um, um, significant like imbalance, right? So um, the second pass is the weak fine. Um, so we notice that weak Y actually is more dominant uh, than the, the second pass weak fine. Weak fine is like a weak fine idle and a weak fine wait. So uh, sorry, Vincent, do you want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, yeah, I have a yeah, question for you. So um, yeah. your problem is between two Numa nodes and you're mentioning weak affine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, what, you, what yeah, what happened is you have the the selector uh, task run queue fed. Uh, look at two candidate CPU, right? The first is the weak weak CPU. The second is the uh, the previous CPU that the wiki was on, right? So it will try to make decision to pick like a uh, one of this. So we have five means. Let's pick the uh, waking CPU. So what happened is with those two conditions uh, met, they always, the, the, the wake always do the wake up fine. Um, oh yeah, I was just, uh, because th there is a case where the wake fin is disabled between Numa and Node. And uh, <clears throat> it's mainly linked to the, uh, what we call this reclaimable distance. So um, if the wake fin is one of your problem, I wonder if it's mainly because uh, it should not set for your in your in your case in your topology. Uh, I mean, if that make uh, the reclaimable really PV. So you're saying just completely disable Wakeify? I, I I wonder. Uh, I mean, it seems that the Wakeify for you is um, is painful in your system, and I wonder. Yeah, I mean... oh, sorry, it, sorry. Is, is it only for this use case? Because it's not normally the way caffeine is not set for all the NUMA level. Uh, That's my point. Really? I think I, I thought it's always set for wake ups. So, so we have a we have a reclaim distance above which we disable the way caffeine. Uh 
Ah. Huh. Then I need to take a look at it. Because uh, uh, with Intel system, um, so two socket system, I think it was always on. Uh, and which, which the, sorry yeah the, yeah the point is that uh, i was looking at the code and the reclaimable distance is 15 which means that i agree that if your distance between your two nodes is below 15 in this case you will yeah set, yeah set the wake of in but yeah uh, isn't uh, maybe your problem is that uh, your node distance oh. is not the right one actually um actually i, I kind of disagree so uh the problem also is well the well let me get to the fix like the question i want to ask is ultimately when we should pull for interrupts right so um it's a, it's a decision that we captain need to make so ultimately you look at two candidates the waking cpu and the the, the previous cpu right if they find different a uh, numero what who get who has the warmer cash, right? That's a decision we want to make. Um, also, we're trying to have like balance the low across Numina. So I don't think the scheduler has the information necessary to, to make that decision, like, right? Because uh, interrupt coming, it may bring the packets, for example, network packet, may bring the network packets that the, 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 the wiki wants, but sometimes it doesn't. Uh, sometimes the old CPU actually got the warmer cash because it has run on that uh, CPU before, right? The other thing is, okay, so can we like allow the user space to say, okay, I want to, you know, do polling um, for for uh, for our tasks um, during wake up, right? So that's the um, second question. The third one is actually the wake white thing. If you look at the code, um, it compare um, it compare the wiki flip between wake and wiki, right? It it just doesn't make sense for like the wake up from the uh, from ISRs, so. Um, my question is, could we have a somewhat better heuristic for, um, you know, interrupts? Yeah, that would be my, um, uh, my presentation. So please jump in. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think for the, for the wake wide right now, it, this has been done. Uh, I would say that's, um, the least, uh, uh, uh worst, uh, solution. I mean, the, we, we, we have this, uh, it's a long problem about uh, should we wake wide or not? And uh, the proposal that have made, been made a time ago was working at that time. Now, I mean, if there is a better proposal, I would say, make a proposal for another wake wide mechanism. That's uh, if you think that there is a, some better way to, to detect when we should wake wide or not. Yeah, I mean, but, uh, I. I, I think it does make sense for certain like workload, but the the, the, the struggle is like we want this to want to hurt other workload well like benefit some just benefit some workload. So um yeah. Uh any other please jump in. I'm so Barry yeah. had a question. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, we have seen uh, uh, exactly the same phenomenon with you recently. Uh, uh, we are running my circle on a full Luma load machine, and the Luma zero get a user card, and the Luma two get a, a storage. Uh, and uh, if we are running my circle, uh, what I've seen is. Numa zero, uh, Numa zero is busy, and the Numa two and Numa three are also busy, and the Numa one almost totally idle. So I think it's the same problem with you, just like the interrupter uh, happens on Numa zero, and the, then the workload uh, are put to Numa zero. But uh, uh, I think maybe it's the same reason the wake of wake wide the worries uh, decide to pull the task from Numa one to Numa zero. But uh, the things I don't understand is that you you said in night load, actually if you disable wake of fine, you are saying you are saying performance improvement. But uh, in my understanding, if you have night node actually one numa is is quite enough right you 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 load it light 
you load it lot busy. So numa one numa is quite enough. So in this case, I think maybe polling task should give you bad performance, not worse performance. That's, that's yeah. the first question I have. The second question is actually, I think maybe pulling a task to uh, to the NUMA load, is it is running, maybe it's a good solution because you still get some case affinity. For example, you get a package from NUMA zero, and then you run a, a threads on NUMA zero, then you get a hot case for the uh, socket buffer. Uh, so yes, what I don't understand why you, yeah. Okay, uh, can you get, explain the second yeah. question? Sorry. Second? Yeah, yeah, could you explain the second question? I didn't get the, the yeah, second, second question is actually, uh, you, you said interrupter and the threads are not related, but for me, they are related because, for example, Numa, Numa zero has a islet and the Numa zero get a socket buffer, get a, a socket package. And if the threads are also running on Numa zero, you got the hard case for the socket buffer. So why why are you saying they are not related? In my oh. understanding, yeah. Okay. What what I mean is if you look at the the weak wire, I'm 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 not saying pulling to the um to the CPU is um not. I'm I'm just saying to look at the code, the weak wire thing. They compare the weak flip. So the weaker actually in that case is just the CPU running on the, uh, sorry, the task running on the CPU, right? So the task could be any task, it's just not the one actually wake the wiki. So comparing the wiki flip between the weaker and the wiki, it just, to me, it's just, I don't see how that's gonna relate it. What I mean is if the weaker is actually the weaker, right? The weaker is actually doing like a, the one actually with the wiki, then the comparison actually does mix. So the, the first question is, um, to answer your first question is that, yeah, I thought that I was really weird uh, because on the lightly load system, actually, you know, pulling to the um, interrupt CPU actually should give you better performance, uh, in, I guess. But also the other thing you want to uh, think about is that does the incoming packets actually give you warmer cache, right? So. For our uh, YSSB, for example, um, uh, each task will, uh, so the client send a, a query to the server. So the server will, okay, let's do uh, process the query and uh, send the result back, right? So the client will, oh, I got the result, then we'll send you another query. So that's the incoming package, right? It's the, oh, could you, uh, we, we got your result, could you execute this um, query? So if you do that kind of comparison, you will notice actually the old CPU actually may have the better cache, right? Harder cache because it's the CPU that actually, you know, um, it was the CPU actually executing all the query, you know, all the table scan the row. So that's my theory. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to uh, uh, say that this problem is uh, quite real. Uh, we have recently have a very big customers that actually ran into this this problem. They have a big uh, new main balance, say, and the reason was because they uh, they put all the interrupts on on the new node where the network card is on. Right, it's natural yeah. to configure things that way, and um, because of the the imbalance, like um, they actually get worse, worse performance. So they have to spread the interrupts to kind of mitigate the, the problem. Yeah, I think the whole reason they won't do that is basically, okay, because the, like I said, like the the NIC, uh, the, the PCFS is connected right to one socket, right? So they feel like it's, uh, um, they actually um, will have better throughput if, uh, if uh, the, the, the interrupt is on the correct, socket so I, this is the whole <laughs> yeah yeah i totally agree it's uh yeah we w our internal customer also have uh, um um see that many internal customers see that problem thank you sorry um uh, i'm so i'm not clear on why you are concerned about wake wide mm -hmm. so as far as i can tell oh. wake wide is like a at least on a large intel system like you have 
um, um, it, why does it know up? It always returns zero because okay. it is based on the square of the number of cores on the socket. Um, and so the only way it can return not zero is if you have um, 48 squared threads that have been forked on your machine, which is very unlikely. Yes, yeah, so, um, so I, I, I have to admit, I still have trouble, like uh, fully understand this heuristic, mm -hmm. the weak way. Yes, um, definitely. <laughs> so, um, so um, my understanding is, um, my understanding is because the weak and the weak is, is kind of um, not related. So um, they actually not related. So um, the so did the multiple wiki actually um, you, like just switch? Uh, you have the multiple task like a cannot switch on this uh, CPU. So um, so it's not. Actually, I don't yeah, know. I, I completely understand your point that the, the heuristic is not appropriate, but I don't think the heuristic has any influence on anything on a on a machine with your configuration. I, yeah, think it's, so, I think the heuristic on every single app, I mean, maybe it's an exaggeration, maybe someone else has some other kinds of applications that have a different behavior, but I think the result of wake wide on every single application on your machine is going to be zero. Uh, well, I think oh. that's not true. That's the point. Okay, it's fine. not zero. <clears throat> well, it is in his case, and it is, I mean... No, we're, we're doing lots 48. of wake wides all over the place. Sorry, what? I missed that. The, the problem is, is that it's the wakey waker statistics are being calculated between processes that aren't related because you got there because of an interrupt. And the theory is that all of those whacked out statistics is causing the issue. But do you think the statistics are ever going to get up to 2,500 between the waker and the wakey? Well, I'll let Lebo step in, right? But you're seeing this all the time, right, Lebo? So it's, it's not returning... Um, yeah, I just um, well, one reason is okay. You you have this um, um, so they use the uh, number in the LC scale domain as the factor, right? Yeah. So uh, the factor is good. actually quite big. So I think mm -hmm. on the Intel chip, is that each socket has a forty eight CPU, right? The twenty four cores. So that number is pretty big. So because like the wiki flip and the wiki flip. Uh, sorry, the wiki for, for wiki and wiki has similar numbers, so they never mm -hmm. got the point. They can, they should do like wiki why. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's the well. Again, like I'm just not fully understand the we uh, the the the, the reasoning behind this heuristic. So, um, yeah, I, it's normally, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I, <laughs> so I think that we should come up with something better. So something, um, yeah. Easier to understand something like kind of makes sense, right? Yeah, um, yeah. To answer, to answer, I, I, I don't know why it doesn't return one. Why, why it returns zero? Why like weaker and weaker? Have a similar wiki flips number. So, um, but the the result is is getting it's all it's almost always return zero. That means they always do the yeah. weaker thing. So yeah, I think it always returns zero. Oh, it's always return zero. I well, think so. Well, I so the numbers have to be so huge for it to be anything other than zero, and the numbers are degrading over time. So yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, so on the very heavy loaded system, you will see occasionally it return one. So that's because I put a trace there, and I saw oh, um, it, it sometimes it does return one, but most of the time it just returns zero. So okay. it's only some very uh, weird case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think the problem is something else. I mean, if the heuristic almost always returns to zero, then the problem is something else. Well, it could be also be the heuristic. Yeah. Uh, Dittema, do, 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 do you want to ask? Uh, we cannot hear your audio. Yeah. OK. Uh, next, please. Uh, I just have a comment, and that is that <clears throat> Maintaining this code is a waste of time. Um, and that's because 
fundamentally the number of times you've had to use the word heuristic, right? I mean, heuristics are going to work for some things and not work for other things. And depending on what you measure, it's going to be good or bad. And yeah. so your outcome is going to be random based on what you measure. What we really need to do is the hard work of plumbing the system such that we actually have real hints for what we want the system to do so that the scheduler doesn't have to guess with a heuristic. That's so true. We could spend the next 20 years w working on this and we'll never get it right. Uh, we really have to just I, I re totally agree. rewrite it. Yeah, I totally agree with you. That's my, that's what I really want. We want something, yeah, we want to rewrite this thing. We want, we want to look at the big picture, right? What we're trying to accomplish during wake up, uh, right? Um, yeah, I, yeah. Sorry, my audio wasn't working. Um, I just wanted to add something. Uh, we also played with this wake white recently and uh, yeah, we saw, we saw this function returning one or zero, but there's more to it. When you look in select task run through fair, um, and you look, go to the uh, for each domain uh, over the temp chat domain structure, then uh, your chat domain has to has to have the SD balance flag set to essentially make a difference. So, uh, and the difference is not to go into the fast path, which would be select idle sibling, but choose the find idle CPU path for wake for wake ups. So with because uh, the topology is, is, is normally by default set up with this SD balance wake flag equals zero. Right. That means even if your wake, if wake white thing will turn one, will return one, you always do uh, the select idle sibling, the, the fast path. So I don't know where, you know, you need both things to see a difference in the wake up strategy. Well, actually, so you but said- But uh, I don't have think it's a wake up problem. The problem is completely somewhere else. It's how the, how the networking cards work and how the network stack uh, looks like. So unless you can get, uh, so, so there are also networking cards which actually allow you uh, proper filtering to the incoming queue. So you actually can move the, the interrupt to, to other nodes if you have enough queues. So similar to what the, the, the block multi-queue does. If you look at block multi queue, that's perfectly fine because the issue is on CPU X and you, uh, the completion and stuff comes back on CPU X and not on some, some random other CPU. So networking is a different beast because you, you do the TX on CPU 10 and the incoming packet comes in on CPU 5. Unless you have really hardware filtering and that's where you want to go because anything else you try to do is bound to fail. It's not going to work. It can't. It's heuristics. And heuristics might work for one workload, but they can't work for the other. So this is a, a whack a mole game. It's, 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 it's totally, uh, totally bonkers to actually think about fixing this in the scheduler because the underlying issue is that the, there's no relation between the, the, the TX and the RX or uh, the connect or let's say the connection but hardware filtering in the network card can actually do that and there are cards which provide that and there you can fix your problem not in the scheduler that's that's just futile oh okay that's interesting okay uh okay i i i i don't think uh yeah, we can talk about this, uh, Thomas, like offline. Um, yeah, I probably have more questions to ask you. Anyway. Sure. Yes, so um, any more questions? Yeah, it sounds to me like the algorithm is wrong, and the algorithm is wrong because we're just not passing information to the scheduler where we're doing the wake up of whether this should be considered a related process wake up or not. That's right. just not something that the way that we can do from the uh, when we call wake up. So if we fix that, maybe this problem will get easier. Exactly. Exactly. Just like cool. what okay. Thomas said, the heuristics are bound to fail. It's designed to fail. Okay. 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 Sounds good. Uh, I think that's awesome. Very good discussion. Um, yeah, uh, we can go from there. Okay, I think the time is up. Uh, Libo, you still have the next talk. Uh, yeah, yeah. So let, me, 
uh, get that set up. But while we do that, it looks like the chat's working again. Uh, I cannot seem to get it working through the integrated bit, but if you would go to the matrix link that James sent last night to all of you, um, it seems to be working there. Uh, and hopefully we can have a discussion like we had last year in the chat. Ooh. Okay, um, yeah, let's check the check is working. Right, leave on the bottom left, there's a plus button that should allow you to choose your slides. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, that would be my... Should, should, should I get start right now? I just like, yeah. Uh, wait. Um, wait Ken, five it, unless you have a question, do you mind turning off your camera? Okay. Okay, let's do you do you want to take a break? I just like uh, I would just continue to uh, continue. We have a schedule. Um. Sorry? Uh please continue. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, so the second one is uh it's about using the LC schedule domain uh with our pass. So um it's somewhat related to the, to my um uh, uh previous topic. So uh, I want to talk about like, um, so first is AMDZ. So I think this guy mentioned last um, LPC by uh, Xi Wang. So basically the, the new AMDZ architecture is much, much uh, smaller LLC scale domain, right? So because they have this CCX thing, right? So uh, Zen 2 only have four cores, so like Zen 3 have a core, a little bit better. Well, uh, so each CCX is on LLC cache. So basically it's a uh, new mono. Right, and uh, it's it's uh, it's essentially LLC schedule domain, right? Um, um, so uh, the polling issue we see um, from last discussion will be most of it. So assuming we fix that, but still for wake ups, um, it just have much less space to spread our load, right? So because uh, on in a, a select idle sibling, right, it, it will try to uh, kind of um, do some smart thing like spread out like loads within the LLC schedule, right? So you basically have less space. Um, so uh, so think about so in an AMD system, you have a two CPU, right? Basically, you are um, choosing between two LLC schedule domain. So you can have those two LLC schedule domain complete full, and the rest of schedule domain just complete idle, right? So there's a possibility that could happen. Um, so that's just not ideal. Um, so uh, that's AMD Zen. So the second is the ARM. So we noticed that in some ARM um, system, um, this is just no LLC schedule domain. So why? Because first, uh, the ARM uh, doesn't um, support high threading. Uh, uh, so that means no SMT schedule domain, right? So some of the chips don't expose the LLC cache, also called SLC. Uh, so I think the LLC and SLC is kind of a little bit different. Um, um, the L SLC is more close to the memory, I think, um, but I don't know the exact data. So with that, the consequence is there's no MC domain, right? So if the kernel doesn't say SMT and MC, it just, it just can't have like a, can't um, didn't have like a, any LLC schedule domain. Um, so, um, so, so how does that affect the, the wake up, right? So, uh, the week Y will like using the size of LC schedule domain as the factor. So if there's no LC schedule domain, then the um, the size of LC schedule domain is zero. <laughs> so what that happens is, so if you look at the code, if it's a zero, it's just always between one, no matter what, right? That means always a week Y. So there's absolutely no week of fine at all. Okay. So this like that's week Y. So the other is this like either sibling? They also look at it for this LC schedule domain, then try to you know spread the task within a schedule domain. So this is no. So um, so those two together um, cause the uh, SCFS wake up just always place the task back to the OCPU. It was on. So it's always doing that. So no matter what kind of workload, no matter uh, this what kind of situation in the system, you could have like. A, um, the previous CPU may be uh, completely saturated, and uh, you know it just not never put back. 
So it's not catastrophic, by the way, because uh, you know you still have a periodical load balancing and you know other load balancing counterbalance. So, but uh, you know, it's just like all the stuff we have in the week of like a Slack uh, task uh, run queue fair, it just like just, just didn't mean anything, right? Just just a completely dumb like a uh, uh, wake up. So the question is, is this something we want, right? So again, so I just want to bring up the question because I think it also bring up like last year. So like, should we use the LC scale domain the way we're using right now? So right, um, again, so if kind of we if it's a pony issue, but still the LC scale domain is very small, right? Um, small to work with, and you know for AM ARM chips, it's always back to the previous video, right? So this, can we do better, right? So I, I, I try to raise, raise this question because uh, I mean, I think there's more innovation in architecture so you can get all kind of weirdness. Um, so uh, I think we want to come to this. Um, yeah, yeah, please go ahead, ask a question. Um, uh, let's for the arm, yeah, for the arm things, is it really, so is it that they don't have cash or that they don't share the topology? They don't share the topology. They do have the SLC. It's hide from us, from the kernel. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I, I would say just populate this in this case, that the best way to fix the problem. <laughs> uh, if we don't know where it, that if there is a cache, and I mean, right now, uh, the, the assumption is that we can make some fast migration between few that are sharing cache because it's not really costly. And we prevent to do that uh, um, at wake up uh, 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 between two different cache level, between two different cache. So I would say it's normal. I mean, if you say to the scheduler, we don't share any cache at wake up, we'll not try to make to migrate somewhere else. And we will uh, rely on the on the load balance to do so, right. to have a more, um, a more I would say, um, um, a clever or smarter uh, load balancing. So right. for, for the ARM part, just share that there is a cache. Then for the AMD, uh, that the same that you are seeing that, uh, so there is only the cache shared between some core, but what's the what's the performance for migrating a task between uh, inside this, uh, this node? I mean, uh, it, that's uh, probably something that we could uh, take into account. The performance with the... the the point is that right now in the scheduler we are defining several levels. One is that we are sharing some. The first one for SMT is that we are sharing some hardware resources, so we not we try to not pack task on the same core right. in order to yeah. not uh, conflict for the hardware resources. The other part is that um, we migrate quickly when we have this kind of shared package resources, which is mainly we are we are. Um, aligning that with the cache level, it's to say we can quickly migrate tasks between CPU which are sharing these package resources because the impact uh, the, the, um, will be um, minimal. And then if they are not sharing anything, we are considering that it's costly to migrate that at wake up. Yeah. So I would yeah, say yeah. it's not costly because of new mechanism. I don't know, maybe now the, the inter, their, their C6 is fast enough that we can consider that as the last level of not cash, but shared packet resources. Maybe that would be good to mention that. I, yeah, I, well, oh, that's so sorry. Uh, yeah, I heard the, the latency across this act is pretty bad. Um, so uh, I don't know if, uh, yeah, I mean, it's probably not a good idea right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Hi, on the on the AMD thing, uh, I did evaluate what uh, spilling over from the LLC looks like on Zen3. Um, I pushed the prototype branch to my Git tree on git.kernel.org. It's the call, it has no locality, and hopefully you'll be able to find it. Um, I found that uh, what I did was that it searches the local LLC first, and if it doesn't have the LLC, then it uh, calculates what the node mask looks like, but takes the LLC out and then continues to search there to a limited depth. 
Uh, it worked reasonably well uh, for some workloads. I'm looking at the results now. T-Bench was a bit all over the place. It was fine for like low thread counts and then slow on higher counts. Hackbench falls apart. Basically anything that looks overload, the increased search depth just ended up costing too much. Okay. Uh, now, now there's a couple of things are, are around this. The, the idea is still fundamentally good. Um, or at least I think it is, but there's other things that need to be addressed first, which means I de de deferred it. One, it is Zintree specific. Uh, the, uh, while Zintree is known to have fairly fast communication to other LLCs on the same local node, it's not true universally. So uh, right. in the prototype, it actually only runs this if it detects that it's running on a Zintree processor and otherwise no. But other things that I've found, our, our overload detection is a bit poor. Uh, one if, if a major factor is due to the wake up granularity where hackpinch tasks get preempted too quickly and it fails to make sufficient pro uh, progress. Uh, I posted a series on this uh, an hour, an hour, about an hour and a half ago. Uh, so it's fairly new and I imagine no one has seen it yet. Uh, depending on how that goes, then it becomes the select idle sibling issue on limiting the depth it searches. Uh, that's a topic for later on today, I believe. Um, but it still hasn't been fully decided what to, to do there. Uh, uh, at the time that I was looking at the, uh, at the Zen 3 specific issue, I came of the opinion that both of those problems should be solved first before wedging a Zen 3 specific um, a search in there. I just thought it'd be premature. And the fact that it showed regressions for some workloads because I was getting the search depth wrong, um, I, I, I felt that needs to be fixed first. But the, the idea is a solid one. It does make an awful lot of sense, particularly on Zin3. It's just not the first problem uh, to solve. It, it should be deferred slightly until the wake up granularity and the select idle sibling discussions uh, get finalized in some way, shape, or form. That's right. Thanks. But feel free to look at the prototype patch if you like. It's old, but it should rebase awesome. fairly easily. Awesome, awesome. I will take a look at it for sure. Yeah, thanks. On the on the ARM thing, I don't really have a, a strong opinion. Um, virtualization, it's the same issue though. That is, that there's no topology exposed, and theoretically has the same type of problem. Yeah. Like to be honest, there, I would think. Uh, if there is no cache information available at all, just fake an LLC and just say it's a socket and just guess that maybe the socket shares resources of some description. It would, it would allow at least for uh, wake wide to work and uh, select idle sibling to at least make decisions on yeah. a memory locality basis and just see what falls out. Um, but otherwise, I don't have strong opinions, largely because I don't work a whole pile in ARM and I don't work a whole pile in virtualization. I know the problem theoretically exists, but yeah, you have to chase it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we would definitely need to do more testing. Yeah, I look at the, yeah. Yeah, because we noticed that that actually having no analysis get domain, uh, it actually worked fairly well for certain workload. Uh, but I, um, yeah, I assume it's probably not work well for other workloads. So, uh, yeah. Imagine it doesn't uh, work well with workloads that uh, really don't want to migrate and want to be left alone as long as possible, like heavily throughput orientated tasks yeah. and nevertheless communicating. Yeah. Um, there, there are some oddities around Noom as well, where sometimes it's better to have them split apart, having two related tasks spread apart for memory bandwidth reason, but there is no. There's no good way of detecting that from a scheduler context. Yeah, yeah, totally. We don't have that kind of information. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Oh, thank I'm you. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks, man. <coughs> okay. Five minutes warning. Hey, Libra. This is Gautam. Uh, we are seeing the same problem on uh, power systems as well, especially on Power Ten, where. The LLC is just one SMT core. It's an SMT4 uh, core. So the problem is compounded by the fact that if we end up, I mean, first of all, the search domain is very small and you end up making the task on the same core, you lose out on the single thread performance while there's a sibling core that's idle. So there is an opportunity cost that we are missing out on. We did explore uh, trying to fake an LLC domain at a higher level, like uh, at an MC level, where we try to put that LLC stack, even though they, the cores there do not share L2. What we found out was for both Hackbench as well as Tbench, 
at, at lower utilizations, uh, the results are pretty good because they'll be able to exploit the single thread performance and the wake up is faster. But as the, as the utilization goes up, uh, I think the, the cache uh, thing comes into play and we see that we are unnecessarily searching over a large space and not really finding either an idle core or an idle CPU. So at a higher utilization, that those, those patches were not really having impact. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I'm worried about as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's the searching cost is it's a problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's 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 a good point. Um huh. Yeah. <laughs> um I, I, I don't have a need good solution for that. We I I think we need to like um discuss like talk about this and do more testing. Um yeah. yeah. Right. Thanks. Yeah, I've seen the discussion regarding IBM Power 10, and uh, I think maybe on IBM Power 10, the problem is uh, LC demand is too small. So yeah. when we select the idle CPU, we can only get four, or uh, on AMD Gen, we can up we can only get up to eight. But sometimes uh, what I have seen is. LLC could be too large. For example, on ARM, sometimes all the socket just show one uh, not slow case. Maybe you have 32 or, 40, uh, or 64 CPUs showing just the LLC domain. And then sometimes uh, the sales prop, the sales prop doesn't throttle well. So in select idle CPU, we will scan a lot of CPU, but uh, they are not idle. So we waste right. a lot of time. So sometimes LLC domain is too small and sometimes uh, the domain is too large. So yeah, definitely need to figure out how to, yeah, actually. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we have the low information for each like, uh, 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 domain, so I guess we can check the. I don't know. We can check the low information and then decide. Okay, if it's too overloaded, let's just like, um, yeah, not the search costs are too high. Uh, I would not. The low is too high. Then let's we let's uh, um, let's search. Uh, let's uh, co uh, have a close range search rather than just go. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so, so the idea, I mean, that uh, some of, uh, I think, I think Shrikar is going to present it in the next session as well, uh, where we want to see if there is a fallback uh, search domain, right, and which, which can be defined apart from LLC. The first level search should be in LLC, but subsequently, if we can expand that a bit, like a fallback, that, that is something that we want to explore, at least for part. Yep, yep, yep. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. <laughs> nice. Uh, we, we have a lot of good ideas, so, um, yeah. Thanks, thanks. I think yeah. what you're hearing is that the LLC is not a universal concept, and therefore right. it's really not a universal um, tool for this decision, right? We need something more abstract. Yes, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, awesome, awesome. So. Uh, Okay, so any more questions? Um, I think the web is pretty good shape. Okay, time is out. So thank you everybody for for the discussion and listening to my presentation. So um, I'll mute myself. Looks like people are starting to return. Barry, are you around? Uh, yes. Okay, I'm going to give you a presenter. Maybe I can start from Aubrey. The best, the best one is for Aubrey. Oh, for Aubrey, okay. So, uh, yeah, um, that, um, Obrey say me that she was not able to to connect. 
oh. uh, to the conf. Uh, so um, I think that team is there. So she proposed either team to to present the result instead of uh, or me if the, if team can do that. So let's see if team is there. Team is there. Uh, yeah, but he's on. Yeah, team is there. So okay. So maybe he can present the the slide for for brain in this case. So Hello, uh, okay, Barry, I'm I'm going to give you presenter mode so you can move the slides. Uh, and then whoever has to speak for those slides, they can um, come on and speak. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is that allow me to present? Okay. Oh, um, yeah. Yes. I can. I can move. Yeah. So. Yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah. Our next talk is challenge of selecting an idle CPU, which um, has a few speakers. Uh, I think it's Barry, Aubrey, Shrieker, and Vincent. Yeah, exactly. So the goal is mainly to make a sum up of the various proposals that have been done around select idle CPU and then discuss what would be the next step. Okay. Should I go ahead? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, so I think this is mostly Aubrey's work and um, so what we have noticed is that um, the select idle CPU path um, does not scale very well. And uh, we use a uh, um, net perf uh, workloads um, and, and try to experiment and we instrument the uh, select idle CPU path and see uh, what happens. <clears throat> so, um, so inside the uh, select idle CPU uh, path, um, uh, there's uh, supposed to be some uh, throttling uh, of the number of uh, idle cores uh, that's being scanned. But we found that most of the times that that, uh, that path was, um, uh, we, we, we did not actually hit that. Um, and uh, and then uh, put a throttle on the number of CPUs to scan. And so if we if we look at the um, the number of uh, uh, CPUs being scanned, most of the time it, it go ahead and scans the entire uh, uh, LLCs um, uh, and scan on the CPUs. And it's okay for when the when the system is mostly um, uh, idle is not very heavily loaded, but uh, things does not work very well if your system is um, quite busy and you spend a lot of time uh, scanning the CPUs uh, without actually finding uh, and uh, idle CPU. So, so the idle CPU scan throttles um, does not uh, work uh, very well. That's say like one one thing we notice. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, let me go to the next one. <clears throat> yeah, so so um, this was the other work that Aubrey did was um, was to try to <clears throat> try to find a way to see if we can uh, uh, scan the CPU faster. Um, uh, by doing uh, uh, idle CPU masks. So we actually track uh, the CPUs that are idle. So when when you scan uh, for idle CPUs, so you only look for uh, CPUs uh, in this uh, idle CPU uh, uh, mask. Um, this uh, has is uh, own uh, problems. We find that the scan efficiency uh, improved but um, the performance is not uh, a universal wing. Like for um, uh, for some workloads, uh, it uh, works well, but for for, for others, uh, it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> I think it is mostly uh, due to the um, uh, the overheads uh, of the idle CPU. Uh, mask uh, update is 
ourselves and and also it's uh, a lot of uh, uh, cash cash bouncing of the IO CPU mask. <clears throat> uh, so so it's still kind of a mixed bag uh, with uh, this approach. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the two um, uh, two outcomes that uh, that we noticed. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks, Tim. And uh, I think maybe uh, a lot of reason is sometimes the bit mask is not accurate because we are right now up updating the bit mask uh, in interrupt time tick. Sometimes uh, the bit mask uh, is not uh, correct, so we yeah. still need to yes. scan a lot of True. CPU. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but we need a trade-off because updating this bit mask is can be time consuming. So I mean if all the CPU are trying to update accurately, this bit mask, I mean uh, I think that's something that Tim has mentioned is that uh, the the bit mask uh, will be the, the critical resource and all the CPU will fight to get it. So we can't really afford to have one bit mask accurately uh, sync with the idle state of the CPU. Yeah, yeah. That's, I'm not sure that's, that doesn't scale really well. So that's why um, Urbref uh, took this to say that uh, uh, we update it when entering idle. So we make sure to update it when idle, but we are removing it only when we are sure to be busy. So at least this remove all the CPU which are long running with long running tasks and prevents uh, scanning uh, uselessly some uh, busy CPU and typically when you are overloaded. Yeah. But it yeah. seems that uh, it's not it's not yet enough. And uh, so from the previous slide, my understanding is that the sysprot, the way we are, um, uh, so we are, uh, do I understand that correctly to say that um, we are not, giving up uh, fast enough trying to find an idle cpu correct in most yeah. of the case y yeah um, and most of the case that you scan uh, a, a lot of the cpus up like most of the case in fact you spend, scan the whole uh, lc domain like, that's bad when you are um when the system is quite busy okay? so you do a lot of work then for uh for no gain okay? yeah and um, okay, and uh, just for me, uh, do you know if it's because we are wasting time? Uh, so we are wasting time. We are stealing. Sorry, we are stealing time on the running task on the CPU, or it's because we are delaying the the wake up of the task that wake up, or maybe you don't know. Because when when we are looking searching for for an idle core on a, an idle CPU, two tasks uh, have some penalty. The one what, what which was running on the CPU. It's just preempted looking for a CPU for the other task, and the task that wake up will be delayed until we found that. That would be interesting to know if it's uh, the running task that is on the local CPU that get pen, uh, that get um, uh, some penalty, or if it's the waking task because we delay the wake up. We may need to actually do some instrumentation too. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, yeah, it was just in case uh, you got the information. It's, it's yeah. both, right? It's both. Okay. It's got to be both. The real question, quick question, Tim, is, you know, how many cycles are we really spending on this? I know this looks bad on a graph, but, I mean, you sort of have to compare it to something. Do you know what I mean? Like, how important it is that we're spending this much time doing this? Is it noticeable? Um, for for the for the micro workloads um, that uh, we are playing around, say like things like uh, Hackbench, uh, uh, Tbench. Uh, actually, this is this will be uh, a, a very significant portion because that most of the time, say there's the the the, the work. Uh, that you're doing is very little, right? So, so most of the time you spend is actually trying to to wake up the the other tasks, and and then the other tasks will run very quickly and then goes to sleep. Um, yeah. So, 
so I, I would say that the problem is a little bit worse that for, for these kind of micro workload that we usually try to evaluate our scheduler on. Um, uh, but maybe uh, not as bad for, for, uh, for like real workload where you actually run for a while and not go to sleep right away. Yeah. With real workloads, we've actually found that both web surfing and memcache style workloads are extremely sensitive to the wake up latency of tasks where you can sometimes get way over a, more than a percent performance difference for the real world workload just by tweaking the stuff in around select idle sibling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi guys, we still have some more slides. Maybe we can move ahead and uh, continue discuss after uh, we finish the uh, presentation. Yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, the issue I've seen is actually uh, LLC domain maybe, is, uh, maybe doesn't always work for uh, some topology like uh, ARM or even power 10, uh, for example, for ARM, um, uh, for Kempon 920, we have uh, 32 or 24 CPU sharing the last level case, and they are exactly one lima load. And uh, inside the uh, last level case domain, we, we have cluster, like uh, uh, four CPU will be a cluster, and uh, uh, actually X, uh, yeah, uh, 86 text rail uh, also have the same issue. For example, uh, text rail has uh, 24 cores that are four of them will share uh, two case. So based on the new topology, actually we can do two things. The first one is uh, we can add a new scheduled domain for the cluster and then we can do load balance between uh, the clusters, actually, we have seen a lot of gain on performance uh, for those workloads who like uh, spreading, like uh, uh, spec rate, stream, and the mathematics, uh, matrix <laughs> and the array operations, and there's some multiple uh, threads, compression and the decompression, and some things like that. And the other thing is we can actually change the uh, scanning order. For example, right now we will scan uh, from the target CPU, but maybe we can, for example, scan uh, from the cluster first. Uh, then after we scan the cluster, we continue to scan the last level, uh, last level case domain. Actually, we uh, we have some prototype to do this, and uh, uh, we are seeing a lot of performance improvement uh, for some scenarios like uh, PG band, T, T band, and uh, MySQL. And uh, uh, one ex experiment, uh, uh, one test we we have done is like, uh, for example, if the tasks are pinging one new load, we just scan. A cluster, we totally ignore the last lower case. And uh, I have seen a lot of increase uh, for my circle, for example, I've seen up to 7% uh, TPS increase uh, for my circle. Uh, so uh, it's just a walk around. If we could, uh, and we can, uh, sharing the case, we, we just uh, return the target, we, don't, we, we ignore the last level case. But uh, for this prototype, if we uh, run tasks on all of the four LUMAS or even two LUMAS, uh, actually we don't gain performance uh, because uh, what I have seen is actually uh, when we can we are uh, sharing a case, we don't scan 
the left CPU in the last lower case, I think maybe it's getting too, yeah, too, too small. For example, uh, I've seen even my circle is quite busy. I can still see uh, one CPU which is totally idle. So maybe uh, because uh, when we can, we can are sharing your yeah, case, I just uh, you, you escape the scanning of the last, uh, the left CPU in a uh, last level case. So the idle CPU doesn't get a chance to be scanned. So, so to me, if uh, tasks are running in just one lima, scanning cluster is totally enough and they it gave a lot of performance improvement, but if the task is a lot of pinning, one lima, actually we shouldn't do this. We should scan more, even we can VK uh, sharing, yeah, sharing a uh, last level case, uh, or sharing, yeah. And uh, the other problem I have seen is exactly Tim and Aubrey have seen, for example, for example, if tasks are pinning one lima, if I, if if even I totally uh, I totally ignore cluster, but if I limited the scan number to four, for example, I, I totally ignore cluster and I scan from target CPU, but I only scan four CPU, I can say actually like uh, up to four or five percent of uh, performance improvement of my circle. So I agree, maybe uh, the six doesn't start very well, it's scan too much. Yeah, that's that's what I've seen. So yeah, actually I've, I have two uh, needs. The first one is uh, what's the best way to scan cluster, and then scan the last lower case. The second one is uh, I've also seen this doesn't start well, yeah, on my platform, yeah. Yes, Sarkar, do you, do you want to continue? Or? Yeah, uh, so uh, on the power 10, right, uh, we are seeing a similar problem like what uh, Barry Song is saying, uh, but here, uh, instead of a cluster, our LLC is itself is very small. Uh, so uh, in what happens is uh, the cores that are there in the same hemisphere, they tend to have a faster cache access in the sense, though they are not sharing the same L2, which is the last level of cache on power 10. Uh, what actually happens is if both of them are uh, having cooperating task, then they still give a better performance. However, what happens is uh, because of the current uh, scheduler where we say uh, the workloads have to be spread, uh, let's say if there are two uh, threads, then what happens is one thread runs on one hemisphere, the other thread runs on the other hemisphere, even though they are uh, cooperating, what happens is uh, the distance between uh, these two hemispheres would be pretty high, uh, resulting in, uh, in a pretty uh, bad performance. So uh, so here what we have, uh, the one of the challenges that we saw is uh, when we are doing the select idle uh, sibling uh, thing, the first thing that we do is we try to select uh, the core uh, based on the weight of the current CPU compared to the previous CPU, right? So because of which uh, one of the thing that, we, that I think we are missing is uh, whether there are idle cores in that LLC or not, right? I mean, it may not help with respect to power 10, but generally what we are uh, doing is, you know, we, we assume that if there is one, uh, if the uh, if we are comparing CPUs, then what can happen is, if it, especially if it's a sync workload, then if there is only one thread running on the current CPU, uh, CPU we think we can just run it there because the, CPU is going to give away its time to the uh, waking uh, task. However, uh, in uh, latency sensitive workloads, right, uh, like uh, the, uh, like, uh, like PV offline or SAP HANA workloads or like what uh, Rick already mentioned, right? So in those cases, when there is an idle core uh, lying beside and we still uh, wait for the 
for our task to uh, schedule out to run the other task we are uh, losing uh, latency so uh, so one thing that i were looking out is can we scan for idle cores and uh, if we find an idle core then prefer an idle core instead of trying to uh, you know, choose the uh, cache affinity because an idle core in a nearby domain is probably much faster and better for a performance than uh, trying to uh, optimize for the cache so uh, that is one thing that we saw in uh, workloads however uh, as gautam had pointed out in the previous talk right uh, the moment we do this i mean especially because we uh, as uh, vincent has also mentioned right we were we are trying to share the data across a number of cpus and because the there is a shared data across number of cpus and we are trying to uh, update it at every time there is an uh, it uh, becomes idle or busy so because of that uh, there uh, i think as soon as the workload uh, increases the i mean the number of threads in the workload increases we are seeing a sudden um, regression we are seeing a sudden um, uh, performance regression but uh, when we further increase the workload then we you know, the regression tapers off so what we see is in the initial if the workload is low uh, this uh, idler llc approach or the fallback llc approach uh, generally helps but if uh, the workload uh, stabilizes to a certain degree it regresses and then it you know, comes back so that is what we are saying so typically what we say is the idler llc is in the llc first try, try to find if there are uh, idle cores or uh, if there are let's say on a um, uh, uh power 10 like uh, situations where there are smt4 or power 9 where there are uh, your uh, llc can have eight threads uh, you also look for the number of idle cpus in the core also in the sense you know, because uh, one core might have just uh, one uh, running task and the other core might have uh, two running tasks in which case preferring a idler core uh, seems to be giving us uh, better performance so that is not something that we are considering uh, at, uh, today so is that something that we could uh, no, bank on uh, again uh, this again is uh, uh, basing on some of the heuristics but uh, uh, and we have heard a uh, few gentlemen saying that uh, thomas and len also saying that you know basing on heuristic may not always help in all approaches but uh, this is one thing that we observed that uh, preferring a idler core uh, seems to give better performance than uh, uh, no, uh, waiting for a cache affinity yeah vision uh, yeah so <clears throat> among the um, the problem that we have seen about which cpu or which core which llc we should select uh, th there is another problem with the current in, uh, current implementation of the select adult core is that so we are trying to throttle the number of the time that we'll spend on looking for an idle cpu or an idle core if possible and the current implementation is based on the average idle time of the local cpu um, which doesn't seem and we expect that to reflect the the state uh, the load state of the all the system but um, it's hardly uh, reflect that correctly, as we have seen uh, most of the time, we are not throttling that all uh, uh, the time spent on looking for a CPU. So um, my point is that in, in, this, uh, in this search of an idle CPU and CPU uh, uh, or core, um, <clears throat> should we change the way that we are uh, defining the, num the time that we should spend? Because right now, uh, should uh, in fact, when we are looking for CPU, and that's what I mentioned previously. We have two tasks which are impacted. The first one is the task that was running on the local CPU. And the other one is the, the one that we wake up and that have to wait for uh, a CPU to be selected. So I wonder if in this, uh, instead of using this average idle time, we should look at something uh, that reflect a bit more um, the current state of the local CPU or the running CPU. Typically, if we are um, 
uh, if we have a long running task that uh, wake up and uh, <clears throat> should we uh, try to spend some time looking for an idle uh, a CPU with some uh, uh, short idle time or at the opposite, if we have a task which is known to be really small because of its utilization, um, should we really uh, waste a lot of time trying to find an idle CPU or we'll just wait, uh, let it on the local CPU and waiting to be sch scheduled more easily, more quickly? So my, my point is mainly that um, we should probably just uh, change and replace this average idle by something else based on the, the, the running task and the wake up task statistic and maybe on the local CPU as well. Don't know. There's also the issue that idle time spent um, takes away power budget from other C from other cores or just compute time from the hyperthread sibling. I don't know how much time we have uh, before the end of the call. I think we five minutes. Five, five minutes. minutes. Okay. Uh, I don't think we should take hyperthread sibling state into account. Um, they, because we don't know to what degree resources are being shared between the siblings and we don't know what the workload is doing and trying to do stuff around that is, is just going to be a rabbit hole that we'd never get out of. Um, I do agree on the, the average idle time thing, uh, just isn't fit for purpose. They, it has idle cores is, um, it's too bad of a heuristic and it returns false. It, it returns false positives uh, far too often. Um, now, I, I did post up a, a push out a branch that was the last implementation that I had of removing sysprop entirely uh, using Aubrey's uh, idle CPU uh, mask. The primary problem I ran into is that it's it, while it, it worked well for some workloads, it fell apart completely for others and sometimes it was very machine specific. So I was never happy enough with it to really try and push it through. But um, looking at the wake up granularity thing, um, I do think that we could, could replace sysprop or at least evaluate replacing sysprop with defaulting the search for the, uh, the full size of the LLC but uh, cut it completely if the number of tasks on the local CPU is above scheduling or latency. Uh, otherwise, decrement that counter, not by the CPU you scanned, but by the number of tasks that are currently running on the CPU you're scanning. So that the busier the domain is, the quicker that uh, the search depth gets reduced. And in the event that it's above schedule in our latency, we just give up entirely. And we assume that the LLC domain is so overloaded that the search is pointless. But um, I haven't actually got around to evaluating that last idea because it only showed up in the last couple of days. But, it, it, but the, removing sysprop and replaced by idle CPU mask, I, I, didn't man, I, I didn't manage to get that into a shape where it was fit for purpose. Yeah, so um, I think that the, the idle CPU mass will not be enough. That that was the conclusion I reached as well, yeah. which is why I started that, looking at other things and current that, that ideas. Helped, that, yeah, that probably help in some way, in some case, in some obvious case, but we still have this uh, mid range where you are not sure about the load and of the system where we have to find something else. And maybe another thing, because I think that we have so also based on the previous presentation from uh, uh, Tim, Barry and uh, Srika, it seems that we might have some work to do on the topology description as well. Maybe the one that we have right now is not of about, right now we have only mainly SMT, last level of cache and all. Should we have a way to better describe some intermediate set? Because it seems that now we have some intermediate set that makes sense in the different state. I don't know, I wonder, but it seems that that might be good instead of trying to fake something or either redefining, I don't know, the, the, the meaning of some uh, some flag, but it seems that we need some more intermediate state in new architecture. 
I'm not opposed to the cluster idea because I think it has numerous applications. Obviously, sort of the ARM one that depends on it. Zen 3, potentially the benefits as well, because Zen 3 could say that the cluster is its actual last level cache, and the, the last level cache it presents to the scheduler is the NUMA nodes. So it would search the LLC first and then fall back. So a cluster will be the real level 3 cache. Um, but they would have to mess around with the naming slightly to make this make sense. But I believe, but don't know, that uh, sometimes Intel CPUs have a core that is more favored than others because it can reach a higher time, uh, a higher turbo boost value. But I don't know that's for an absolute fact. But if it's true, then it would make yes, sense that true. Intel. There you go. Then Intel uh, chips potentially could use a cluster as well. In the cluster being your. Um, uh, your max turbo boost is the first one you should search and then fall back. So but short, I'm not opposed to clusters. I think that, that they have an application more than just ARM. Yeah. Sorry to run over. So, yeah, we are running out of time, but uh, <clears throat> maybe we can continue on the on the chat and the, the mailing list. But... That's why we have the hack rooms, right? Discussions don't yeah. end here, they, they stop. Um, yeah, we'll continue in this case in the hack room, but yeah. Thank you, Barry, Vincent, Shrikar, and Tim. Uh, we're going to just take another quick five minute break here. <laughs> uh, back from the break, uh, we have Daniel Jordan from Oracle talking about remote charging. Yeah, so should I get started right now? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, so as Davil said, this is remote charging in the CPU controller. Um, I uh, have been working on this problem off and on for uh, probably the past few months and even less often before that, but it's been bouncing around in my head for a while and I figured it was high time to, to get the ideas out and see how people generally feel about them. So my main goal for the session is just to, to describe the problem well enough that people understand why I would like to do this remote charging thing. Um, so, so the issue is that there are a few different paths in the kernel that uh, where kernel threads become very CPU intensive and they consume a lot of cycles and they're doing that while they are working on behalf of a C group. Um, and the CPU controller today doesn't have any mechanism to throttle these K threads or, you know, make them pay for the time they've spent later on somehow. So the places where this comes up are, there's this newer feature that the kernel got, I think two summers ago, June, 2020, the kernel um, got PA data multi-threaded job support, which is currently only used to initialize the struct pages at boot time on x86. It uses all the CPUs and it makes quite a difference in kernel boot time on machines with a lot of memory. Um, that was a great first step for the problem. And it was kind of a special case, which is why it was the first step. Um, it happens at boot time before user space is up, before we really care about resource controls. But there are all, I mean, there are other paths that we would like this functionality for, and all of them can be triggered by a user space task. One of the pieces of feedback I've gotten upstream is that all these, these extra threads that I start need to be beholden to the limits of the initiating task that starts the job. And of course, that includes the CPU controller. So here I am. Um, but I'm not, the, so, so that's, that's my primary interest in the problem, but there are other people and other use cases. So um, in particular, Facebook has put forward a couple of them. Um, I've talked very briefly and a, a while ago with Tejan and Johannes about this. Async memory reclaim chews up a lot of cycles. And we've got KSwapD now that may be reclaiming pages on behalf of the C group. And we also have this patch that Facebook would like to merge that introduces something called CSwapD, which does it in an unbound K-worker for uh, when a group starts to hit its memory dot high limits. And um, the idea there is we want to account the cycles that these K-threads are spending back to the group whose memory is being reclaimed. And, uh, you know, similarly, this is also one from Facebook. In NetRx, we spend a lot of time on CPU. And moreover, we spend it when we're pinning what amounts to basically a random victim task. And, you know, we want to account the cycles back to the group that the packets are destined for. So, um, 
there have also been general complaints from Android about this problem. They haven't gotten all that specific about which K threads are doing the consuming. Um, if anyone here knows, I, I would love to know more about it. But, um, you know, those are the use cases. Um, and one of the things that makes this problem, which has been around for a while, um, kind of interesting, I guess we should say, is that every use case is a little bit different. And some of the use cases kind of rule out some of the simpler approaches that we could do. So with Reclaim and NetRx, um, the idea is both of those paths are doing really high priority work. We want the pages back to the system. We want you know the packages to be received and to stop pending this random task. So we can't, or it's it's undesirable to um, to throttle those kernel threads in real time. What we want instead is to account the time that's spent in doing that work and then somehow pay for it later. Um, and then you know uh, NetRx is also kind of a special case in that. It has to start accounting the cycles before it knows the group to account to. So, you know, it has to do enough processing of the packets to learn the port and then, you know, the task and then the group. And so another sort of requirement around making this work for all of the problems is being able to support a method that can account before it knows where it's accounting. So, you know, those two things basically rule out some of the more obvious things that have been tried. Um, basically anything that involves spawning a K-thread directly into a C group, migrating a K-thread into a C group. Um, there's been a little bit of discussion about bouncing the work to a K-thread that's already in a C group, but that's cost prohibitive for things like NetRx that don't run for all that long at a time. Um, so I, I, I hope I've gotten across that it, the requirements all kind of imply that we need some kind of a way for the kernel threads to be accounted outside of the group, which of course leads me into remote charging. So, you know, the high level idea is um, we want to, you know, save the time that we spend and then push it to the task group to be paid back later somehow. And in my prototyping efforts thus far, I've spent a lot of time on the weight control, not as much on bandwidth, and not at all on UClamp, though not really sure we would want to do that for UClamp, but you tell me. Um, I, I see remote charging happening in kind of three phases, at least the way that the prototype looks like this week. Um, you know, first, of course, you have to incur the debt um, when the K threads are running, and I've got some interfaces that are living in sched slash core.c with all the other CPU controlled callbacks. And the K thread can call CPU remote charge begin. You can note the absence of the C group argument to that function so that we can handle the NetRx case where we don't know where we're accounting to yet. And you know, inside that basically just saves a timestamp. Um, and then, you know, anytime during the time that the kernel threads are running, uh, we can call into CPU remote charge account to push what debt we have incurred so far to the task group so we can start paying for it sooner rather than in a giant mass at the end. And then of course, when you're done, you call the end variant. Um, I'm accounting debt to both the target task group, whoever that may be in the hierarchy, as well as all of the parents up to, but not including the group. So, you know, that's phase one, just the K threads incurring the debt. Um, kind of the, the second stage of this is of course paying the debt. And the mechanism that I'm choosing to do that with right now is increasing the V runtime of the group entities that are in debt. So uh, when such a group entity is switching off the CPU, if put prev entity, I'm increasing the V runtime to force it to stay off the CPU longer than it would otherwise. Of course, for such a method to be effective, there has to be competition on the CFS run queue or else it's all pointless. And, um, you know, I think there's some latitude for implementing some kind of debt forgiveness, but I may be getting way ahead of myself because, you know, that's all in the details. And as I said before, my main goal in this session is really to just get a feel for how people are thinking about this approach. So, um, you know, those are the first two steps, just incurring the debt in the K threads and then paying it in the group entities. The third step is that once 
the, the runtime of the K-threads has been increased, there may be some sort of scheduler event that changes the scenario so that we need to remember the debt that we have paid by increasing the V runtime, but not yet actually settled by forcing that proof entity to stay off the CPU for longer than it would have. So such events might include, you know, the indebted group entity goes off the CPU. Of course, we need to stop then. Um, there's no more competition. Number of running falls to one on that run queue, um, or else the indebted entity itself is switching back on the CPU. So we need to save that extra V runtime for the next time it goes off. And you know, it, it, the question naturally arises: like, How do you quantify what debt is unpaid, given that increasing the V runtime is sort of causing an absence of something? You know, the boot entity is not running. Um, I, I've tried to illustrate that with the graphic on the right hand side here. So this is you know, drawn from the perspective of an indebted group entity. So of course it has a sked slice and if it's got competition, it's also got time that at least in the ideal, it's expected to be off the CPU. And if we didn't care about remote charging, we weren't um, thinking about that at all. The, the only thing that would happen is the sked period would pass. And again, in an ideal sense, the K thread would get one chance to run within that. But because we've increased the V runtime, now the K thread is forced off the CPU for a little bit longer than it would have. And so what I do is I basically just take a timestamp when the group entity switches off. And then I take another one whenever one of these scheduler events on the left happens and see if I've gotten outside of the off CPU time yet. And if so, I can quantify how much debt has been paid, if any, and balance the books. So, so that's sort of a quick run through of the of the high level approach and i i do have more things to say in the next slide but i think i think i'm going to pause right now and just open it up for anyone to to give any initial reactions to this thing that i've just described a, a quick question is it always possible to find the the correct c group to charge uh, for example, say, uh, I think you mentioned the page reclaim using uh, KSwap D, right? Um, so so the, the, the pages that you are reclaiming um, may belong to a C group, say, but actually the reason that you are reclaiming pages from that C group is because some other C group is requesting the, the memories, right? Yes. So, yeah, so you... Like if you charge the time to the to the C group uh, from whom the memory you are reclaiming from, you may actually be charging the wrong person. I completely understand the point that you're making, and that had also occurred to me. Um, you know, this idea. Uh, I think I can't remember if I heard it from Tajan or Johannes in that thread, but. I think, I think one way to think about that is, yes, the, the decision about which group to account to and reclaim is arbitrary in that way, but it's always proportional to the amount of memory that the group has on the system, at least I think, um, in the sense that if there's a group that's, that's, that's putting a lot of memory pressure on um, that, Group will get more cycles accounted to it than other groups if you follow. So, is this a um, solution searching for a problem, or do you? I mean, I understand it looks more fair, right? This would be more fair, but is, is there something actually going wrong because of this that we're trying to fix? Well, the idea, I mean, is that the kernel threads are escaping the, the CPU controller. So on a system that's using this feature, um, you know, this, this background um, 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 activity is potentially allowing a group with very strict limits to interfere with other groups in a way that we don't intend. Um, you but know, do can you actually demonstrate that? Like does something actually fail or is this theoretical <laughs> well i mean we're not talking about correctness really i mean maybe correctness of accounting right 
So it's not like, you know, I'm not sure what um, um, failure mode that you really mean here. Could you expand on that? I mean, um, yeah. yeah, so can you show when this is working versus when this is not working, something works better? Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, failure is probably too strong a word. I, I, yeah, I probably uh, maybe this is a better word, but you know what I mean? Like, okay, what sure, better? sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, so I mean, take the, um, the weight based control, say. Um, you've got two groups, A and B, and the weight of A is 10 times that of B, right? And B starts one of these jobs. It's, say, it's starting a virtual machine and it's on a big server. And so it wants to use a lot of CPUs to uh, pin the pages, and uh, its 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 weight does not entitle it to the amount of CPUs that it is using. And so, and so, this feature would um, help to account the time better in that way. I mean, you can directly observe that the CPU time of both groups will converge more to the ratio of one to ten than they would otherwise in that case. Okay, so you can measure when you've succeeded. Yes, the, the metric that we're looking at is CPU time as, as expressed through weight and bandwidth. And and I, oh, see, you go ahead, double, sorry. Um, sorry, I, I did not follow the protocol correctly. Uh, would, would it be fair uh, for me to, you know, phrase this slightly differently saying the problem is this extra accounting uh, or rather, rather this extra free time a user is getting a cloud provider may not be happy with. Um, and they, they would like them to get the time that they're actually paying for. Well, that's true. I mean, especially if you look at it through CFS bandwidth. I mean, uh, they could, you know, in these paths, get more CPU time than they are allowed. So I, I do see in the SCAD IRC channel a question about why can't we just uh, move the task um, temporarily? That will absolutely work for PA data, but um, we, it will not work for Reclaim or NetRx because we don't want to throttle those in real time. We, we can't have the threads be throttled when they're doing that kind of high priority work. It's best to, to, to pay it later and, and have tasks that are actually in the group pay for it. All right, well, if there are no more questions, I can say a little bit more about the status. I'm not sure where we are on time. About 15 minutes left, I think. Uh, I, I've seen a, another comment from Peter, I think. Maybe we could bring that into the talk, if, but otherwise I, I can always look later. Um, so, the current status is that I, I, I do have a prototype that does all three things that I mentioned. It incurs, pays, and saves the debt. And I have done some bare minimum testing to make sure that this is behaving the way that I expect. Um, but there's a lot more to do. And in particular, of course, we need to have some idea of the performance impact. Um, I haven't touched CFS bandwidth yet in the code, and um, I would need to work on some of the more fine points. but. I definitely think that given the comments so far, we need to uh, converge better on, on to what extent we need to be accounting all of this work and um, make sure that people have a better understanding of the problem. Uh, hey, uh, Saravana here. Um, question, maybe you already kind of taken this into account, but some of the work use, and I think the K threads, you have K threads that are processing work use. And if you are going to restrict the CPU time a K thread is getting subsequent, 
items in the work queue, uh, the system work queue could get delayed in terms of processing, right? Yes, that's true. Yeah. How much of that have you kind of looked into? How, how is it going to complicate this? Well, that was actually one of the objections to one of the previous approaches. So if I go back here in the slides, um, one of the things that I worked on and I was piggybacking off of a Red Hat engineer named um, uh, Vanden Doss, I was trying to make work queues C group aware. And I was actually migrating the workers into the C group at the time that they were running the work. Your question is about, you know, what happens when a K worker is running and, and being throttled and, and holding up works that are behind it on the queue. This proposal would avoid that problem by not throttling K workers in real time. It would be just timing the work that they're doing and then uh, pushing that time to the task group to be paid later. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, well, uh, the, the feedback so far is, is that I think people are, are maybe still a little bit confused about, about what the problem is and, and why this feature um, might be needed as opposed to other you know, conceptually simpler ways to do things like uh, migrating threads, moving threads around. Um, if that hunch is right, could somebody Maybe I ask a question so I can clarify. I feel I'll, I've got more details to present, but I don't want to dive too far into those without without making sure that everyone is on the same page. No, I follow you. I thought you clarified well. Um, probably the way I should have asked my question was, how do you measure success? I see. OK. All right, well, I'll just get into some of these questions then. Um, and I guess I better bring this up as long as the discussion is not off to a fast start. Um, in my testing thus far, uh, I ran a simple experiment where I'm on a two CPU VM and I've got some long running tasks. Those are the blue and the purple. And I'll focus here on the blue on CPU zero. And then there is another task, uh, the, the uh, um, yellow task that's just woken up that is in debt. And the weights of blue and yellow are the same. So what I would expect you know, in the absence of other factors is that blue and yellow would get about the same time on the CPU and switch off evenly with each other. Um, and then because yellow is in debt and its VRUN time is being increased corresponding to that, that yellow slice would actually be smaller initially than blues. But what I saw actually was the exact opposite, um, at least initially. And then as you can see, um, with more sketch slices passing, eventually we do see yellow slice start to shrink relative to blue. And the behavior I was seeing is actually an existing problem in the scheduler where the debt was being effective. It was forcing yellow to be off the CPU for longer than it would have been otherwise but it's because uh, yellow's group entity, the load average in the task group hadn't had, um, had a chance to stabilize. And I'm sure that most scheduler folks are aware of the problem that group entities um, weights are overestimated if they've been idle. So when they come right back on, on CPU at the beginning, uh, they get an unfair amount of CPU time due to some approximations that we have to do, and I think it's calc group shares. So, um, you know, for tasks that wake up and have to pay debt in short bursts, it is so effective even if it looked otherwise. <laughs> Sorry, uh, do you have the, the wrong behavior of the previous? I mean, uh, my understanding is that what you're showing is the uh, correct behavior? I'm not sure what what was wrong and what have been fixed based on your... your yes, yes. Uh, uh, it, there's actually nothing wrong. There's no problem. 
I was just bringing it up um, uh, to, you know, mention that if, you know, the, uh, the just to harp on the existing problem, um, essentially, that we have this estimation logic that doesn't always work, work as well as we'd like it to. So do I am correct? To, uh, this is a bit out of, uh, not related to what you were mentioning before about accounting uh, some uh, additional runtime. I'm wrong. I'm not sure to catch, but I should see there, in fact. Okay, sure. So, so uh, the yellow task here has just woken yeah. up and it's had that accounted to it. Yeah. So my expectation would be that since the weights of blue and yellow were the same, that yellow and blue would would get equal runtime without debt, but because they did have debt, yellow would have less runtime, and that is not the case. And I'm simply pointing out the interference from the overestimated weights of group entities. So there's actually no problem with the debt implementation. It's just sort of an, an, an unfortunate um, side effect of how the scheduler behaves today. Okay. Uh, yeah. And. Uh... <clears throat> So, okay, it's not related to the previous, okay, I understand a bit more. Right. Yeah, there is some, uh, some approximation, I mean, it's always, uh, but uh, yeah. Um, also, yes. I'm a bit surprised about uh, the three depend of the skip period. I mean, uh, I don't know how long you're running, but or how long you are idle, but uh, if you are idle more than the skip period, then in this case, we will just, uh, we'll get more credit compared to others, but they're always running tests. Not sure okay, okay. I'm, uh, I'm following No, it's question. just that that really depends on how long you're idle compared to your skip period, because we are capping all the V run time. And so I'm not sure if there is a real problem there. No, no, I, I mean, it was just a side effect of the experiment. It, it was just kind of a way to show some of what I'd been thinking about and some of the unexpected things I found along the way. It doesn't involve debt, but there's actually no issue. Um, Daniel, if I understand it correctly, the plot that you're showing is with your changes, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, I think it might have helped to have a graph that didn't have your changes. I think that's where, what that's what's throwing people off. Okay. Oh, that's good feedback. Yeah, yeah. I, nothing. I thought the key up here on the upper right. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I I spoke over you. All right. Okay. So uh, so here are some points for discussion. Um, you know, one of the problems that I've that I've come that that has come up in this work that that I really don't have a good answer for yet is. Um, it's not always correct to incur debt. So if the system is sufficiently idle, then there's no reason to be incurring the debt and going to all this trouble of having to pay it back. And yet uh, CFS generally doesn't have a habit of keeping global statistics of any kind, well, with some exceptions, um, notably the load average in task group. Um, so, you know, this is kind of a meta question of this work is you know how much do we really care about balancing the books absolutely correctly um, what heuristics might 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 be the right ones how much trouble are we going to go to um, so i had some ideas about um, about trying to collect these metrics but um, it's early phase yet and they may not be worthwhile um, another question about the implementation is where should debt be stored? So when K threads, you know, save the time and they push it to the task group, uh, I see two options. You could account it in a global bucket and task group, or you could do it locally in the group entity that's going in debt on the CPU that the K thread happens to be running on. And, um, you know, clearly there are some obvious upsides and downsides to both. Global is very simple. It mimics CFS bandwidth in a lot of ways in that you're trying to take a global quantity and distribute it to all of the per CPU components of the group. 
Um, and it also means that debt won't go stale. It, it won't get stuck in a local bucket and never be paid in case uh, the group also has some CPU affinity settings that preclude it from ever running on that group entity or, um, or else the system just happens not to schedule on that CPU very often. Conversely, of course, you've got the scalability of the local approach in by, by saving it in SCED entity. Um, there's just a little bit more complexity if you're even willing to go there in terms of making sure that you know, debt doesn't accumulate in a, in a place that, where it's never used. Um, so you, know, you, you could imagine um, pushing up the debt um, in a tree so that it's not all concentrated in one CPU. Um, got a one minute warning and I, I, I can't see my slides anymore, I'm not sure. Should I take presenter back? No, I can just minus it. All right. And then finally, um, there are some limitations to using the view runtime to pay debt. So, um, you know, if there, if the task group is not competing with any other entities, then obviously it can never be effective. And I have seen cases in my experiments where the system does happen to schedule groups um, in silos of CPUs, I suppose you could say. Um, such that, you know, the debt, again, will never be paid. Um, in practice, for real things, I don't think this is a huge problem. I, I have observed that the scheduler tends to, to schedule tasks from different groups together on the same CPU often enough that, that this may not be a real issue, but um, nevertheless, for things like CPU affinity, it could still be a concern. Of course, there's also this sort of second order effect where multiple entities that are all in debt might be scheduled together. And in that case, they would all be paying debt against each other, basically for no purpose. So um, perhaps some additional logic about tracking uh, whether there's at least one entity that is, that's not paying debt might be called for in that case. Was uh, pretty much all I had to present. Uh, are there any further questions, comments? Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank uh, you very much, Daniel. Thank you for your attention, guys. Yep. Thanks. Um, so it looks like people are back. Our next talks by Piet and Dipmar. Guys, go ahead, take over. Okay, thanks. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Dietmar. I hope my, my mic is not too loud now. Um, Beata and Ivan work on the ARM kernel team, um, and we would like to present or discuss her ongoing work on per task IO boosting. Uh, since uh, she was on holiday, I prepared some slides, and that's why I will do the short presentation at the beginning. So uh, let's first recap what IOBoost is. Uh, the picture on the right hand side is uh, from a discussion between Joel and Peter from 2017, in which Peter explained uh, how CPU frequency can affect IO performance. Uh, just to summarize, the boost helps um, the IO weight bound task that it has usually a low utilization and hence would uh, choose a lower CPU frequency by itself. Um, the boost simply lets the I.O. cycle time decrease and uh, the throughput of the I.O. Oper operation increase. Current design. Currently, um, I.O. boost is implemented within Shed Util Governor as a per CPU mechanism. Uh, boost can be built up by CFS task uh, in I.O. wait during their NQ. There are four discrete boost values covering the uh, CPU capacity and utilization range between 128 and 1024. Zero would mean no boost. Um, on the right hand side, you see a block diagram illustrating how the boost can be built up, maintained and reduced or even resetted. Um, without going into the details here, um, there, we have to deal with the Sugov rate limit, which is a default value of 10 milliseconds. 
We have systems specifically in the ARM world sharing uh, CPUs and uh, CPU policy, uh, CPU free policy. And obviously we have to deal with a tick value which um, is used to reset the boost. All of those things have an influence uh, on whether the boost is increased, decreased or um, maintained. And um, Sugov uses the max out of the natural CPU utilization and the boosting when it asked uh, the, free, uh, the hardware to set the new frequency. What are the issues with the current design? Uh, first of all, even though the boost has to ramp up over time, there can be still sporadic uh, frequency spikes. That's because since it's a per CPU implementation, unrelated tasks can build up the boost. Issue number two is specifically uh, for uh, IO devices which have a long response time um, and that can hinder to build up the boost. Uh, specifically when uh, on ARM devices, if when the, when the tick is only 100 milliseconds. Uh, third issue, um, we can see this on our devices where we have to deal with shared policies. Um, the frequency setting for, for a CPU B, for instance, can reset the boost value which was built up on CPU A, uh, even though the SUGOF data is completely per CPU. Um, the last three issues here on the slides, uh, that uh, task migration should follow, uh, the task migration should uh, lead to also a boost migration. Uh, the uh, task UCLAMP should be able to cap Task boost values, and finally, uh, that boost should be into uh, should be taken into consideration for task placement on big little systems. Uh, it's not addressed by the current design. So uh, the new design proposal is to move I/O boosting from the governor into a per task mechanism. We track two signals. First one is the time. Uh, being blocked on I.O., uh, which we therefore call um, sleep time. And the second one is uh, between wake-ups of an I.O. task. Um, and this is what we call I.O. sleep time plus runnable time. Uh, only those two signals allow us to discover um, I.O. wake pattern, which we call modes and then to map them into task uh, boost levels, uh, similar to the one we already see in Sugov. Um, the weight signal, it means the first thing is, is essentially sufficient to discover the tendency of the boost signal. Uh, that means whether it has to be increased, maintained, or reduced. Um, this is done by comparing the delta, that means the current and the previous sleep time value with a, with a margin. And uh, we distinguish three different modes here, increase, maintain, and reduced, uh, reduce the boost. Um, so when we deal with reduce boost mode, this will automatically uh, translate uh, into the action to actually re reduce the boost of the, ta of the task. The second signal I mentioned before, sleep plus runnable time, is used in uh, the other two modes, which uh, are increase and maintain. For an example, if we are in increased mode and we figure out that the task was mainly sleeping, that means more than 75% uh, 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 which is another margin um, of the um, second signal, sleep plus runnable, then we wouldn't actually further boost the task because uh, we, we simply think it's not worth to do it because it's running for such a small amount of time. Um, to summarize what's on this slide is we think that we need both signals, not only the, the sleeping signal, uh, to set the boost level for a task and uh, therefore to be able not only to uh, respect the performance requirements of this task, but also uh, the orthogonal requirement of uh, the energy consumption. And on this slide, you see an example of what I just uh, uh, what, what I was just was talking about. Uh, this shows a simplified presentation of an IO bound task uh, with its activation and uh, sleep time phases. Uh, we start here 
a task wakes up from IO, uh, and this in this moment we would set the task boost mode into uh, into an increase mode. That means we would essentially set an, an initial boost value after the value was zero. Then uh, we detect that the IO sleep time reduces more than a certain margin, and that means. Uh, we can uh, conclude from this that the boost is actually working and we would increase the boost further till we reach a moment where um, the runnable time and the sleep time are stable. And this is where we would switch into maintain boost mode. Um, the boost mode dictates boost levels. For instance, if we are in um, increase mode, and the task is running um, more than 25% of its sleep and runnable time, then we would set, uh, we would increment the boost load, uh, boost level by one. Um, obviously, having this information per task is good, but uh, for frequency driving, we do need some kind of per CPU or per run queue aggregation. And currently, this is implemented as max aggregation when uh, such an IR. IO weight task is enqueued. Um, this per boost level, this per run queue boost level, sorry, has to be implemented also as a signal to be able A, to uh, retain the boost level on a run queue when the task with this high, with the highest demand uh, goes into another IO sleep cycle, or B, um, uh, when, uh, when we want to set the boost level to zero, uh, or consider another IO weight task uh, on this run queue. Then, uh, then, then the highest uh, boost level. When the highest task with the with when the task sorry when the task with the highest boost level migrates. Um, so uh, before I hand over to Beata for the discussion part of this uh, presentation, are there any questions uh, regarding the contents of the slides so far? Seems not to be the case, so we switch. Maybe Beata will cover this, but we talked about some um, coin toss and playing with the margins and whatnot. Uh, I was wondering. Yeah, this is. I think this is our first discussion point. Um, I, I just described briefly. We do need some margin to to set the boost mode between increase, maintain, or reduce, and the coin tossing is essentially applying heuristics uh, when it comes to compare the the uh, sleeping time and the sleeping plus runnable time. Uh, that's correct. Uh, uh, Dietmar, thank you very much for uh, for this presentation. Uh, I might be still in a holiday mode, so please bear with me. Um, I hope you all can hear me properly. Um, as for the margins and uh, the coin tossing, um, the proposed solution is making some assumptions on uh, how the sleep mode uh, and how the runnable uh, time is going to play out and uh, whether you're going to see some patterns in it or not. Uh, coin tossing is, is, is heuristic. So uh, the heuristic did show up uh, on today's conference already. So it will work on certain cases. It will not fit for others. So that's why the coin tossing. We are trying to make the best decision out of the data that we have. Uh, but we also need to consider the possibility that the decision will not be um, the perfect one for each possible uh, uh, Margins are there to control the boosting. If we are moving the boosting from Sugo, which is the per CPU uh, feature, and we are moving this to be a per task feature, uh, we are losing some of the options that Sugo is using to, to constrain the boosting and keep the boosting value um, in line. Uh, so we are losing all the, all the timing um, aspects that Sugov is using. So the tick and the rate limiting, we don't have that when we move to the per uh, task boosting. So uh, the margins are there to make a kind of as safe as possible decision on whether we should maintain the boost, reduce it, or boost even further. Um, so what we've been experimenting with so far is um, predefined margins that have been selected uh, based on the ability to make a quick calculations. 
uh, but the margins were telling us whether we are seeing a significant increase or decrease in the reported time for either sleeping or while waiting for the IR quest to be completed. Uh, and the same uh, goes for the runnable time. So those margins are telling us if it's a significant uh, change or the change is small enough that it doesn't really make an effect on the overall performance and energy consumption. So this is where the margins come into play. Is that clear enough? Okay. No, yeah, no, I understand. Um, yeah, got it. Um, so I have actually, I kind of gone through slides and a bunch of questions on it. One other thing is, Actually, a more fundamental question for me to understand itself. When you're talking about IO boosting, I was kind of looking at the upstream kernel code. The number of locations where IO schedule is called is kind of, is not that high. So, what are we considering as IO weight? At least from, so, from a common uh, perspective. Uh, the, the reason I'm asking this is, for example, we're trying to render a frame and we send something to the GPU and waiting for it to come back. Are we going to consider that as IO weight or not? Uh, possibly, yes. Uh, I don't think that's in all the cases, uh, but yes, uh, the IO weight is being triggered whenever the IO schedule is being called within the scheduler. Uh, that's going to be mainly block devices, file systems, NFS, and, and related uh, related things. So okay. it's are, kind of like a broad scope of, of use cases. Are, are we, is this kind of applying for networking use cases too, if you're trying to do a packet transmission? Is that something that's considered IO weight or no? No, I mean, uh, in case of networking, that's going to be uh, with the NFS, which is a file system of a network, right? So it falls down under the file system. But... Yeah, no, I was thinking more in terms of just, like, say, download upload speeds. One of the, one of the issues we've seen before in other products is uh, it, it benefits to run uh, the CPU faster when you're trying to do transmission, re receive and transmit, and that's going to affect your upload download speed because you, you're trying to send packets and the network card is waiting for you or trying to receive packets and it's waiting for you. Mm -hmm. That's one case where it helps. So just kind of trying to understand if you're trying to solve those kind of problems too. If you're not, that's okay. But it's kind of uh, Honestly, I haven't checked how it plays with the networking stuff. So I can't really... Uh definitely say whether that's gonna help or not uh, that depends on how the networking work is being scheduled okay um another thing unless somebody else wants to talk and please turn on your camera and i'll give some more like can i i'll stop talking um another thing i had in mind was um similar to networking this is like a general theme of problems that need to be solved maybe io boosting is not the way to solve it that's okay um but say you're having two devices in a producer consumer uh, fashion, GPUs is an easy example to kind of pick. And um, you need to run them both CPU and GPU at different frequencies to get the performance you need. But there are multiple combinations of the, their frequencies that would give the same performance but have different power impact. Uh, that's something that would be good to solve from a community perspective. I've been thinking about it and been playing around with some of the stuff that's kind of very different from what you're doing. That's why I'm asking about it, but it's too early to kind of share anything useful. But that's an open-ended problem that needs to be solved. Yeah, so uh, the, the solution we are proposing, or we are trying to uh, kind of describe on, on this presentation is uh, we are aiming to increase performance, but we also want to save the energy. And uh, because we are making decisions on the boosting level, so how much we are going to boost and thus influence the, the frequency increase, uh, that is based on what kind of behavior we are seeing uh, with regards to the IO block time and the runnable time, because we are comparing the two. So uh, the whole mechanism is kind of dynamic and it is supposed to adapt to the workload changes. So you're going to see uh, increases of the boost level or decrease of the boost level, depending on how the timing plays there. Um, and we also are trying to find the point when boosting uh, doesn't really reduce the time spent while being blocked on the IO request. We are assuming that at some point, even if you reduce the time spent on the CPU, it doesn't really help uh, the device. So we're assuming that at certain point, the device is possibly running on its high performance level. Um, so we don't want to boost even further. This is for the cases when they share the same uh, power or thermal 
uh, domain. So it is supposed to be um, uh, dynamically adapting to this case. Uh, so if, if you have a, um, a CPU and GPU, and then we see that the uh, time spent on the GPU doesn't change much, despite us boosting uh, the frequency, we will stop boosting because we don't see much point of going even further. Uh, it will also try to reduce the boost if it sees no changes in the timings, assuming that you might have chosen too high boost level for a given workload. So it will still try to adapt to whatever it's uh, being reported. I have some responses, but I want to let other people talk. So I'm going to. Hi, I was just going to add uh, to this question. Uh, so there is more than GPU device. Um, we we would like to see uh, some other mechanisms like the interconnect where they are actually pinned to some uh, in our case big cpus when you increase the frequency you actually increase the frequency also of the internal buses which also affects your io to the storage uh, such as ufs um, so but this is not um, addressable in a straight way uh, because the the interconnect framework is kind of a static and it makes some assumptions but the major goal here is just to uh, have a, a working proof of concept to increase the frequency of the cpus and then maybe think about more uh, of those related devices such as buses or gpus or another so stuff this is kind of problematic from that point of view that uh, scheduler doesn't have any information uh, regarding which device is actually performing the IO request. So I don't think we want to bring that information into the scheduler's work. So all we can do is uh, try to make some kind of decisions based on the response time. I don't think we need to make aware of um, how we can change the frequencies for the devices that are serving the IO requests. At least that's my opinion. I agree the interconnect is a different problem. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. um, in your proposal, um, I don't see uh, anything related to the current frequency of the CPU, which impact the running time. I mean, we have tried to make the scheduler and everything frequency invariant, which means that the value that we have doesn't depend on the current frequency. But that doesn't seem, so, it seems like you're going back to the fact that you are computing absolute runtime or sleep time, and then you will overestimate the run, the running time at low latency, at low frequency, which will, yeah, you will bump the frequency too much, then go down and up. That seems to be a bit, um, uh, that would be good yeah, to, uh, to, to, to prevent this kind of a ping pong. Yeah, that, that's uh, one of the things we, we want to address uh, that uh, goes down to which uh, clock we are using to, to get the timings uh, for the sleep time. Uh, so that that remains an open issue on our side. Uh, but yes, uh, that's a that's a that's a fair point, and uh, this will affect uh, the timings calculated here. Yeah. Yeah. If, was was this was this a remark uh, related to um, build up those signals uh, based on the PELT infrastructure we already have um, using the PELT clock or? It's just that, um, yeah, we have this spell clock. I wonder, I haven't looked in detail, but uh, the waiting time on the CPU, I wonder if we can not just sum up this kind of the belt signal uh, of the running time and some are you waiting time? And that will just scale and give you how much time you are waiting, whatever the frequency. Which means that yeah. if you are this, I don't know if you're decreasing. I mean, the point is that you could compensate during idle the fact that you're running at a lower time. No, I don't know. Yeah, the point is that I, I see some kind of the result that you have will change according to the current frequency. And and that's exactly what, what we have tried to remove uh, everywhere in the scheduler. You have a metric, whatever the frequency, the results stay the same. But, yeah, uh, yeah. That's, that's, that's a fair point. Yeah. That's, that's still uh, something that we need to address. 
um, if you were referring to using the runnable uh, signal, if, if I understood you correctly? Uh, not especially the runnable, I don't know, because in the runnable, you're not always, uh, you're not, um, you, you're not in IO8, so in runnable, you're in yes. queue. But I was wondering if you could use a pulse signal that you can simply sum up with the running time. Uh, in theory, so you will get, in theory uh, yes. Yes, that's doable, but then also comes the problem of the cost of using pulse signal. So uh, I, I guess that we need a little bit more testing on the performance side of the whole solution itself. Um, what to note that this will be placed on the wake up path. So uh, we need a little bit more experiments to see whether having a simplified signal versus per a full blown signal uh, makes sense uh, from the perspective of the, of the overall performance. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's it's something that might be considered, uh, although we're still aware of the costs of that. Yeah, this is definitely, I mean, we have to get the signal in schedule, right? And then try to wake up for IO wait task, which is a little bit outside the realm of, of, of CFS, but if, if this is possible to inter introduce a, a new PELT signal there, then it also could use the, the PELT clock. Actually, I was going to, um, I wanted to ask a question about exactly the mechanisms, right? Because we've been talking about uh, the policy and when we make frequency changes decisions and stuff like that. But the how we deliver the boosting into the wake-up app and into schedule chill is actually an interesting question. And okay. And if I, if I, I mean, from what you have explained in the slides, I think one of the things you're trying to do is have a signal per task, and then you increase the signal and then aggregate it per rank queue, you max aggregate it and everything. And all of that sounds an awful lot like you client, for instance. Uh, so think... The max aggregation on the rank queue, yes, that's, that's uh, resembling your client behavior uh, at this point, yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it just, you know, it's a, another maybe approach for this would be to basically have something where we say that we could have, um, you know, kernel driven Euclid values, and then we would get some kind of governor that would decide when to boost a task and set the Euclid pin of a task to a higher value or something like that. Um, uh, that's, that's an interesting idea. Uh, I'll probably have a look at that. Yeah, um, it might, yeah. It might make sense. I think you have problems um, with how to, you know, if you have requests from user space and from the kernel coming in that often, you know, what do you do? But but there still yeah. comes the problem of uh, determining and syncing uh, whenever user space and uh, kernel space uh, change the Euclid value. So yeah. uh, there yeah. might be a little bit of tossing of that. Uh, but yeah, that, that that might be interesting. Thanks. Um, as for the uh, decision making and the uh, details, so we are experimenting currently with uh, those two signals, which are implemented as uh, EWMAs. Um, the wake up, uh, this the fleet time and the IO sleep time. Uh, the same way as delay account block IO and the same way as number IO weight are being implemented or decremented for the ranking level. Uh, so it's plugged in the same places. Um, as per the runnable and uh, sleep time combined as a sig uh, single uh, signal that's uh, being uh, calculated on the NQ time. So that's time between wake ups from IO. Um, so uh, this is kind of also like a two stage uh, decision making. So uh, upon registering that the task is going into sleep and then coming out of, uh, is being woken up out of um, IO, that's the first stage when we try to determine what's happening with the sleep time. So that's the first stage when we are setting uh, the, the, the boost mode, whether we are increasing, reducing or maintaining. And then when we reach the NQ part, it's still only the CFS tasks, and by the way. And once we uh, reach the NQ time, we are having the second stage that tries to determine what the runnable time is also changing as well. And if it makes sense to reduce that even further. Um, if that clear answers to your question. Yes. Um, it wasn't clear to me if this was already addressed. Are we, how is this going to affect task placement? Let's say increased performance is going to help. At some point, if it's a little CPU, it might not be sufficient. You might need to move into a bigger CPU. Yes. So that's that's one of the. Well, that, I... quick, quick second question is how what use case are you using to test if it's helping? Whatever you're doing. Uh, could you repeat the second part? Sorry. Uh, what's your use case you're testing against or a benchmark to figure out your changes okay. actually? Right. Okay. 
So, so your first question, uh, that's something that uh, Dietma was mentioning uh, in the part of issues with the current design. So currently with SUGOF, we have no control over uh, the boosting value. So for example, you can completely decide SUGOF has no notion uh, for that. Um, it, we don't have support for task migration. So task migrating to a different CPU, definitely migrating to a different cluster needs to build up its boost uh, from scratch. And there is no task placement uh, support for boosting uh, IO bound workload. So having uh, the idea of tracking the boosting per task gives us the ability to fix those three points. So uh, the boosting is strictly connected with the task. So whenever task migrate, the boost follows and it stays on the last recorded uh, state. Um, we can easily uh, respect UCLAM because the boost level that we are using, they are resembling the SUGOF boosting, but we are mapping that to the utilization. So it's very easy to, to clump the boost level within UCLAM uh, minimum and max, maximum values. And that also can be used on the task placement. So we can- But currently you're not using it for task placement, right? Currently no, but okay. the idea is to, to plug it in and, and to use it, yes. Uh, so, so that's what we're trying to, to achieve. Uh, one quick uh, thing before my time runs out, the idea of having per task boosting is not my idea that has been suggested before by uh, Quantum. Quantum, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I just want to give him the credit that that's, that's, doesn't come from me. As per the testing, uh, we've been testing mostly on the asymmetric CPU capacity systems. Um, I've been using um, a benchmark like FIO, Sysbench, uh, with the IO uh, benchmarking testing with it. Uh, so that's mainly what we've used for testing. Uh, we do know that we have a little bit improvement on the performance side. Um, if we have performance upgrade, we still consume more energy, but how much we can uh, tweak that still needs of testing on different setups with different devices and different workload characteristics and my time is up i just want to add a few things just for like that you can have relationship with the per task is just to explain this is required because in android for instance there is a desire to disable this ioe post for certain tasks because we don't want them to uh, like consume energy and just to give the background of why the spare task and UCLAM relationship is just, we don't want this all the time. You want, we don't want IO weight boost for certain tasks and that enables us to do that, which we can do today. Thanks. Thanks guys. All right, with that. Thank no. you, Beata. Thank you, Dietmar. Thank you guys. Thank you. That was a really nice talk. Uh, we'll go back to a break and start in another five minutes. Um, as usual, I'm gonna start a poll. Um, Vincent, you should now have presenter mode. Yeah, it works, just checked. Thanks a lot. Okay, okay perfect. Uh, it looks like a bunch of folks are back. Uh, and, and with this, we uh, move on to our next topic. Um, which is the final topic for the conference. Uh, Vincent's gonna be leading on improving responsiveness of CFS with Utilist Tent. All right, may I start or should we wait a bit more? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, you're good to start. Okay, all right, uh, let's go. Uh, so, uh... Hi everyone, I'm Vincent. I'm working too uh, for, um, in the Power Kernel team. And today uh, I'm going to show you a bit some research that we've been doing uh, for the mobile application and uh, how the mainline kernel is responding to uh, interactive tasks. Uh, what we mean by interactive task is task where you cannot really predict uh, the behavior and for which the uh, UT leverage doesn't work very well. Uh, so I'll start with a bit of history. A uh, couple of years ago, my colleague Douglas shared the RFC about how to improve uh, Schedutil uh, and introduced a concept uh, that we're going to be reusing today. Uh, that concept is to use Utilis to detect when a task is getting bigger. 
Utilev basically holds the last value uh, of uh, util average uh, at the DQ of the task. So it gives you basically an, uh, the highest uh, value of util, uh, util average that you can get. So you can make better uh, placement decision and frequency selection. So what it means that uh, you can observe if util average is crossing the util list, uh, it means that the task is getting bigger than previously thought. And so uh, if this happens, it means that the previous placement is wrong, that the frequency selection is wrong, and we need to react to this. Originally in this presentation, uh, Douglas wanted to use this thing to improve the frequency selection. So it was really uh, at the schedule level. And the idea was to try to cover for some util average issues that he observed, uh, if I recall, mainly due to some lost idle time. So as you can see on the top graph here, uh, yeah, there is a drop into the util average and it leads to a drop in the util frequency. So we introduced this way uh, by detecting when we cross the, bond the utilized boundaries to add a boost and uh, to improve the frequency selection. Uh, so this year we've been working on uh, some workload uh, and one of which, which is uh, a benchmark, a PC mark, uh, the web two part, which is, well, basically just a very simple browsing usage. You are on Android and you just load the web page and then you just scroll down. Uh, we've been comparing uh, how Walt uh, performs for a such thing versus failed. So work very quickly. That's the way that Qualcomm is evaluating the task utilization. And we found out that for a such, uh, for a such task, when you've got a task, which is suddenly getting, uh, very big, well, world uh, is, uh, way much more responsive. And the outcome of this is a way better, uh, benchmark result, a way better, uh, user experience. So now the idea was to reuse uh, the original idea from Douglas, but to uh, put it at the task level and to create a new signal that can be kind of a boost, a ramp boost. Uh, the, the concept is exactly the same. You look for a task uh, when the UT leverage is crossing UT list. If it does, it means that we need to react. We need to potentially up migrate the task, we need to change the frequency. Uh, so you have a, a virtual uh, boost signal that can trigger a misfit. So the flag that will uh, re-enable the uh, load balance on uh, ES yes system uh, to up migrate the task to a bigger CPU and also raise the frequency. Uh, the boost value that we picked is uh, very simple. It's just a difference between UT list and UT leverage uh, times a factor that we're going to talk about uh, later on. Uh, that simple relation uh, helps to avoid to have any margin. And the longer you cross this UT list, uh, the most boost you're going to get. So it's interesting because if the task is just slightly um, over, over each utilize, well, the boost will be really small and it will have very few impact on the whole, whole system. But if you have a big task that suddenly becomes very huge, well, the boost will have a lot of effect then. So uh, we've been looking for evaluating this solution. Uh, so for this, we use the Pixel 4, uh, which is, well, kind of a two years old phone now. And we use the mainline-ish kernel. So I say mainline-ish because it's still the vendor kernel, but uh, with uh, a lot of backports to have at least the scheduler part to be as close as possible from mainline. The idea was really to evaluate how to make mainline better for uh, such application. So uh, we tested that kernel without any uh, vendor value add, without any uh, Android hints or boost. Uh, we run 30 iterations of Android to, to uh, of PC Mac, sorry, to be sure that we have something that is statistically significant. And you're going to see some energy estimation uh, on the following graph. So uh, the energy estimation are based on the idle states and the frequency selection and the energy model declared for this platform. So it's interesting because that's the values that have the kernel to take decisions on the uh, placement for the task. But we know that it has a lot of limitations. Uh, for example, some idle states are hidden 
from the energy model, or uh, we know that uh, power domain is shared across several CPUs, uh, and this is not something that is described into the energy model. So it's interesting in terms of uh, comparison, but it's not something that we can take as an absolute value. So the first test we've been uh, playing with is the data manipulation. It's a simple test from PC where you just draw graph and then you just crawl. And what we've seen with this is that applying the boost doesn't change anything uh, in terms of both performance and energy. It's still quite interesting because it shows here that the boost won't just randomly uh, add uh, some boost anywhere. It's really when it's needed and in a search test, for example, in search workload, there's no big changes in the task size. So there's no need for any boost. So yeah, we are not wasting any energy. However, if we apply the same thing with the web two that I previously introduced, so the uh, web browsing part, we we'll see like substantial changes. So in blue, you have the performance improvement that we managed to get across different factor. So remember the factor is uh, what I described previously. The boost is equal to the difference between utilities and util average times that factor. So of course, the bigger the factor, the best performance you have, but the biggest is the energy penalty you have to pay. So it shows how effective it is for such uh, for such workload and uh, what it uh, it can bring to the mainline kernel. We wanted to go a bit further uh, with that boost, uh, and uh, there's another component to utilist uh, that I haven't described yet. Uh, this is the AWMA. So uh, what is it is when you have uh, utilized and queued, so the value which is read at the task BQ, uh, this value is hold. Uh, so basically when you have uh, subsequ subsequent, sorry, small activations, the utilized EWMA will hold uh, a bit uh, the utilized value. And then the utilized value is just the maximum of the enqueued and the AWMA. So this is interesting. If the task becomes suddenly way bigger, we can anticipate this because we hold the AWMA. So that's the green part where it's actually a win of using the AWMA. The downside is the gray part here where we just wasted a lot of energy to hold the, uh, the utilized value while the task was small enough to use probably a smaller CPU or a higher frequency. What's in, what is interesting here is that the green part where the EWMA component is interesting is exactly where the boost I've just described is having an effect. So it's meaning that when the util average crosses the utilized. So we are hopeful that a such boost could at replace uh, this signal. So we wanted to evaluate a bit uh, how uh, the AWMA, uh, removing the AWMA performs. And we actually managed to get some unexpected result. Uh, we hope that uh, by removing the AWMA, we would have a tiny drop in performance and potentially a tiny drop in energy, but it's actually uh, the opposite that happened. Uh, we have some ideas about why this is happening, but it needs to be investigated. In any cases, it's really interesting because it shows that uh, with the boost, we uh, are probably in the right direction and uh, removing the AWMA is, the utilized EWMA, sorry, is not harmful for the performance uh, of the system. So yeah, that's it for presenting this, um, uh, this boost. Uh, so now if, uh, anyone has any comment, ideas, uh, any benchmarks suggested to uh, make sure that it doesn't hurt anything. So I, I have a question. So <clears throat> one of the things we do in Android to uh, make belt more reactive is by tweaking the, the belt half-life. Uh, is this something you have tried? Have you, have you compared just like making the belt half-life shorter versus having this boost or? or... Uh, 
I haven't compared it yet. Uh, yeah, we thought about uh, having a look at this, but uh, yeah, the problem with the Pelt uh, Half-Life is that, well, it applies to all the tasks. Uh, you have no control over it. Well, here you can easily imagine like uh, to add some control to the boost. Uh, it's also compatible with Uclamp. And also, well, if you move the Pelt Half-Life, well, it works in one way, but it also works uh, in the other way. So all the frequency will drop faster. So uh, this is definitely something, and I kind of expected that question. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, this is definitely something we need to uh, evaluate how it compares against the PEL value. Uh, the thing is that also uh, it fits uh, quite nicely into the scheduler uh, because we already have UT list, we already have UT leverage. Uh, well, currently PELT is uh, hard coded, uh, so. And that's also yeah. what uh, pushed that direction. Okay. Okay. So yeah, uh, and yeah. I, I understand. I think it's uh, the crossing point of UT list and and the well, the, what you call the UT list and UT leverage is an interesting. Like, it's a very interesting point. But, yeah, it's it's you know, really just... saying we we base all our task placement and frequency selection based on UT list. So if suddenly the estimation is wrong, we need to react. And... Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. So I'm glad that you're analyzing what, <laughs> because the things that are implementing are what I implemented while I was working on what. <laughs> so I'm glad to see that you see the benefits of it. Um, having said that, all of the code is GPL, so it should be fairly uh, easy to port it over to Pell. And that's something I'm definitely interested in uh, looking into. Um, and to give some more context on um, utilist and the issues you're seeing. One problem with utilist is we forget utilist value too quickly. But if you try to remember it for too long, you have the problem of in your uh, graph, you had a green area where you're wasting, or not green, the gray area where you're wasting energy by holding it up for too long. And um, one, if you just look at the GPL code that's published for Walt, you'll notice that it is. Um, basically keeping a heat map of your different util values across of say a 1024 scale. You split it up into buckets. Say, I'm just making up a number, let's say 10 buckets. You're basically saying in this particular range, have I ever had util fall in this value? Like has, has util average ever fallen in this bucket? And you just kind of remember that and that will also help you jump faster instead of going just by the factor between like what you consider the boost, where utilis, where util average is exceeding utilis. Um, But yeah, I'd be more than happy to kind of like work on this too and try to put what's there in the code that's published outside and see uh, if we, how it compares to what you're kind of working on. And one question from my side, like when we come up with the, uh, a solution to to change the half time of, of Pelt, isn't this actually fighting against UTLS and not only the uh, the EWMA problem with the boost? I mean, if we if if the signal can can ramp up much faster, then why do we need UTLS at all? Uh, well, de define faster, right? Uh, I mean, UTLS just give. Uh, uh, a bit. Utilize allows to do better task placement uh, and uh, frequency selection when you place it. I mean, when the task is activated because you know already. So I don't think that uh, you can okay. get rid of uh, utilize just by uh, uh, just by increase uh, reducing. Sorry, the uh, because, of life. Uh, because we we have to do the synchronization against the CFS run queue before we do task placement decision on it, right? And, and like a faster, a faster ramp up would also mean a faster decrease, and that's why it yeah. won't bring anything. We still need utilities for this kind of yeah. problem. Okay. Yeah. You need so for if you have like a long that that was the original use case I think for utilities. It was like long sleeping tasks. If you have a task that wakes that sort of yeah. that has a periodicity that is misaligned with the pelt period, then you quickly forget, and then and then the placement. Uh, the, the placement you do, you do is going to be wrong. The task placement in particular, the frequency selection is not too much of a problem if you have a fast, uh, like a eight millisecond 
Half-Life for Pels, then you will fix up the, the frequency selection quickly. But for the task placement, where the, the task wakes up after a long sleep, then if you forget what the value was, then you will pick the wrong CPU, and then you have to have migrate and all that. So it takes it takes you a while. So I think I think you would still need utilized. And I think the problem Vincent is effectively seeing is that Utilis is still getting forgotten too quickly. And that's what really needs to be solved. Vincent, you yeah. Oh yeah, uh, I, have, I mean, you have two questions that you have tested several factor level. Which one will you select and why? <laughs> because that will <laughs> become a heuristic. Yes, and the other I one mean, is that, uh... Do I understand correctly that we can replace the EWMA by this? So I mean, uh, it's, uh, so I mean, uh, I'm afraid about accumulating one feature, another one, then another one, and at the end we we end up with a ten additional feature feature on top of that. So would it mean that we could replace EWMA with this boost? So that's uh, so for the second question. Yes, that's the hope that it could uh, we could allow to get rid of the uh, of the WMA. That's uh, yeah, that was this slide. So because the WMA helps on the green part, but if we have already a boost that helps at the same part, there's no real need for using the WMA. Uh, and yeah, the downside is that's a virtual boost, right? So uh, yes, there is some heuristic here. Uh, involved as per the, the factor. And uh, this is currently uh, sadly just, um, uh, yeah, based on test. Do you have comparison with Vault after these changes? You are trying to have graphs and show how quickly it reacts. Uh, I I don't, uh, I don't have the, tr the, uh, the traces here. Okay. I was kind of curious how much it kind of brings it closer to that implementation. Uh, Vincent, maybe you can also mention when do you apply the boost? It was for those long running, more long running tasks, and uh, you can't really apply the boost on top of the util average all the time, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, in the in the uh, proof of concept we developed. So yeah, it's uh, it's when you read uh, misfit uh, when you set or not uh, misfit. Or well, more generally, the CPU overutilized. And when you try to get the frequency, uh, when you get the value uh, of the utilization to set the frequency. Uh, and the boost is, of course, updated uh, only during a tick because that's the only, uh, that's the only place uh, we really care about. When we enqueue the task and the uh, average, the uh, utility average is updated well. We do not expect the utility average to be uh, bigger than utilized, so on the left. And when we dequeue the task, unless this is for migration, uh, we uh, we know that well. We don't have an updated value of utilized, so the boost uh, doesn't make any sense anymore. So the boost is uh, set only during the task tick. Right. Any other and I'll question? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. And um, this boost with the IO per, per task IO boosting, this look to to input for the same kind of uh, feedback on the on the uh, schedule and so on. I mean, do you think that that should, could be uh, merged in one boost value? Or? Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, I mean, clearly, is, there's no point in uh, adding both. Uh, so uh, we should probably just take the max of it. Uh, maybe like from, from an implementation standpoint, uh, since we haven't finished those, uh, the, the IO weight implementation, I think we should keep them separate, but keep this in mind that essentially they, they're doing the same kind of thing. Uh, but before we talk about those things, we ha we have to have like a, a, a working implementation for IO Boost, we, which we can share. No, 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 my point is that both they want to boost the frequency based on something that we are not already aware of, that is not already reflected in the 
task statistic. So that's why they, 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 sure. they seem to be pretty similar in the result, maybe not for the input, but in the result, they want to add some kind of a, a additional uh, utilization for, uh, for the CPU and the frequency se selection, for the CPU selection and the frequency selection. Yeah, yeah, definitely there are some uh, common ground uh, well, uh, when you apply the, uh, when you read the virtual, because, well, the IO boost would like also, yeah, to increase the frequency selection and to also potentially up migrate. So at those two places, uh, like at some point, the two boosts should be aggregated to take the biggest of both. And uh, just, um, I don't know if you have done similar tests, but um, one problem with the utilization and per task utilization is that when two tasks are fighting for the same CPU, their utilization can decrease because they are waiting to, for running. I mean, how this can impact uh, your boosting, I mean. Uh, uh, so for in that case, the, the frequency should already be pretty high, right? Because the, the CPU is free. So hopefully you don't see the problem as much. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, probably. And in the uh, yeah, in the uh, the idea here is also to uh, just aggregate when you have uh, 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 several tasks that need boosting on a single run queue. You just take the maximum of the boost at the uh, run queue level. Um, I was going to ask Vincent, uh, because probably there is some confusion. The IO weight boosting is more kind of virtual, while this one we are going to use all the, also for the energy estimation, isn't it? Or uh, There's no need to use it for the energy estimation because, you, uh, I mean, you're talking about for the task placement, right? Yeah. Uh, so there's no need to read it here because uh, you're gonna uh, estimate the energy at the task placement, and when the when the task activates, and when it does, uh, there's no need to uh, use the boost because there's no boost at that time. We know that the uh, due to the last activation, the utilist is already updated, so there's no boost needed here. Okay, so it, this is going to be. Um also like the IO weight boost, it's not affecting the energy estimation at all. Uh, in this one, yeah, for sure, yeah. The, the IO weight boost very much should impact the energy level, right? There's no reason why it shouldn't. Well, we don't account that task as the real utilization, right? We account it as a small task, the real util average. Yeah, but uh, of this the, fact that task. There is a boost, the fact that there is a boost associated with the yeah. task will result in the frequency in which this task will be placed, uh, you know, the, the yeah, frequency. Yeah, the frequency, the frequency selection. The, right. Yeah, the frequency selection is true, but the, the energy for this particular task is taken from the from this task util, the real one, not the boosted and, value. And the, but the frequency at which, I mean, we estimate both two things in the energy model, right? The time that the, time that the task will spend on the CPU, that's based on the utilization. But we also estimate the frequency at which the, the CPU will, will be running. And for that, we account for things like uClamp and all of that stuff to make sure that we reflect the, we predict the frequency selection correctly in the NRT model. So yeah. I think the so, boosting should be accounted in that part as well. So the boosting will be, but we are not going to measure how big the task is when we ask for this energy calculation. It will be from the real util, not the yeah, any yeah, correct, correct. virtual. The time needs to be correct, but, uh, yes. Yeah. So this yeah, two virtual. So yeah. So these two virtual new uh, metrics will be taken into account only for frequency, while for the energy they will be always those small tasks. Let's say task n util will still be ten util for the energy cost. But it would it will drive the cluster frequency higher, so we will pick up higher power number for that cluster. Exactly, exactly. We just need the the the, the, the performance state prediction needs to account for the boost. 
that's, that's yeah. the only thing I'm saying. So I think we, we agree. Good. Yeah. I think we would have the same problems like with Euclid Min today when it comes to those decisions or not. Uh, exactly. There's, there's already a uh, separated path uh, in the compute energy function. Uh, Three minutes, any questions for the three minutes left? Not related to the stock, but is there going to be a buff for the scheduler stuff or no? Uh, what, sorry? Um, so the answer to that is there are a bunch of hack rooms. If you get people together uh, and, and use one of the hack rooms, um, these are always available, and I would highly recommend that, right? The, the goal of the session is not to uh, solve the problem entirely, but get a start and, and you know, continue it on on mailing lists um, elsewhere, and hack rooms are a great place to go and continue discussing that. Um, any more questions for Vincent? Yeah, well, uh, maybe one thing regarding this um, hacking room. Uh, is there a way to to send to everybody that uh, will join an hacking room for one special topic? I mean, for example, for this one, uh, how can we uh, broadcast that uh, we'll continue discussing this uh, uh. boosting value? So, do you have access to the matrix instance? Um, maybe I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, there's. I, I'm going to paste the link on. I, I think I put the link in there at the top of the public to share notes. Right. Um, Steve, what's the official way to coordinate? I mean, I was going to go with the unofficial way, which is go on to matrix and figure out the time. Yeah, that. Yeah, I guess we really don't have an official way. That would be a good idea. Besides, yeah, the matrix that we are expecting the matrix to be working, and that was somewhat of a fail. Uh, but we should have like an announcement thing. Maybe I wonder if we should post something up that way people could, you know, say, "Hey, meet here," and we could put up like a bulletin board somewhere. I'll ask. Okay. Uh, but at least for the time being, right, the, the matrix instance is just a great place to coordinate and, and figure out. Okay. I'm totally familiar with the way the matrix instance. I still get communication error with the home server. Uh, are, you, are you connecting from the desktop client or the web client? Because the web client seems to be working, but I'm also having issues with the desktop client. Uh, the web client, I just clicked on the link from James' email. Put my username and password and keeps being giving me the error kind of communicate with the home server yeah it gives m unknown i can't get in via web client either uh, uh, by the way when you that? when you type in your e or your username yeah. replace the at sign with a period for your email you've done that correct <laughs> <laughs> it took me some time to figure out this it's written uh, just at the uh, some uh, in in the in the logging window but yeah yeah, that yeah, we joke. A, well. a few of us were saying, "Yeah, people." Or James is like, "Oh, yeah, it's simple. People will easily be able to figure this out." And we're like, "No, I think it's going to screw up a lot of people." <laughs> well, it's it's out it's auto filled in, right? And so, yeah. yeah, yeah, I copied from James's email when I noticed that. Yeah, it's not auto filled in for me. I I didn't know that I needed to replace it with a dot, but I don't think it's auto filled. Well, James owes a lot of the program committee. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Beers because we had a bet that it would screw up a lot of people, and he's like, he said it wouldn't. Clearly, James had a higher opinion of us than we do of ourselves. <laughs> okay, um, thank you, Vincent. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining into this micro conference. This micro conference is not possible without the speakers, obviously. Uh, as well as everyone else who joined into the discussion and helped make it productive. 
Uh, I hope it was productive. Uh, you know, there, there are many topics that felt unfinished and I think, I think that's great. We should probably continue on uh, using a hack room and making progress there, continue on the mailing list. I would also like to take the time to thank uh, Daniel for you know, really running this show. Uh, Vincent, Yuri, and Chris helping out with the organization. And of course, the LPC committee and our sponsors for helping out so much. Oh, Daniel's here. And your audio is not working. Uh, and then there is a keynote right after this. I think you have to go to the referee track to attend the keynote. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. See you on the mailing list.